afternoon, everyone. It is three o'clock and I would like to call the meeting to order and on behalf of the Board of Trustees extend a heartfelt welcome to all of you who have joined us for our February 23rd, 2022 virtual public board meeting. And it gives me great pleasure as per our tradition to open our meeting with prayer and I'm honored to turn it over to Father Julian to lead us. Good afternoon, Madam Chair Palazzo, Trustees, Chief Superintendent Martin, brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us begin with God's great sign of love for all of us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. John, one of the disciples, said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Friends of Jesus, in today's Gospel, John the disciple complains to Jesus that some people, not of their group, were driving out demons in Jesus' name. And then watch Jesus' respond, response. Do not stop him, he says to John, for whoever is not against us is for us. What a wonderful, generous attitude this is. John was undoubtedly angry that someone outside of their little circle was going to get credit if you think that this sort of thing only happened in biblical times, you haven't spent much time around the church. I am a priest and a proud one, and I love and admire all of the great people who do so much for Christ's kingdom and for very little compensation. But I've also been around to see this problem on the parish staff, in the Yas and Parkhill offices, and among parish communities. We get so tied up in our little games and protecting our turf and making sure things go according to the bureaucratic structures that we have established, that we forget what the mission of the church is all about. What Jesus saw was that the mission is what matters, bringing God's love to the world, being a conduit of grace, that's what truly matters. All of our personal glory, position, privilege, all of that is finally a matter of indifference. Bringing God's love to our students, to our staff, to our parents and guardians, to each other, to the world, is what truly matters. The response for the following intentions is, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. For Catholic education, that our Catholic schools may be inspired by the example of the many great saints who have gone before them and who intercede for them, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That our Catholic schools may reveal the glory of God in all that they do, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That our Catholic schools may nurture the growth of wisdom and virtue in the young, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all the families whose lives are peace-filled and joyful, and for families who face the challenges of illness, unemployment, marriage breakdown, or poverty, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For peace in the world, and especially in Ukraine, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty God, Bestow upon all of us abundance of your grace and protection. Grant health of mind and body. Grant fullness of charity and make us always devoted to you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father Julian, for leading us in prayer and for the impactful reflection of our division's mission and theme and reminding us to joyfully embrace our division theme that God calls us each by name and bringing God's love to our students. Moving on to 1.2, I am honored to read our land acknowledgement. 
We acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of Treaty 6 and home of Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4. We also acknowledge the Inuit and other diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors have marked this territory for centuries, a place that has welcomed many peoples from around the world to make their home here. We at Edmonton Catholic Schools commit to restoring and honouring the truth and reconciliation calls to action. We strongly believe that truth must be acknowledged to move forward to reconciliation. Together, we call upon all our collective communities to build a stronger understanding of all peoples who dwell on this land we call home. Next on the agenda is 1.3. And as we are all once again on Teams this afternoon, we will request a verbal acknowledgement from each trustee for the purpose of roll call. Just a friendly reminder to trustees to please use the raised hand icon and turn on your mic when ready to speak. When your name is called, please indicate present for the record. I will call names consecutively according to wards beginning with Ward 71. Trustee Harris, go ahead, please. Uh, uh, present, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Mutala. I'm here, present, Madam Chair. Thank you. Trustee Ingle. Trustee Ingle, I know you're here, yeah. right? Present, yeah. Madam Thank Chair. I just Thank kept you. turning it on and off and on yeah. and off. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Vice Chair Tuchansky. Present, Madam Chair. Thank you. Trustee Taber. I'm here, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And I also uh, consider myself here. And so for the record, please note that all trustees are present. Moving on to 1.4, approval of the agenda. And I am looking for um, a motion to approve today's agenda. And I do see Trustee Mutala in queue. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to approve the agenda for February 23rd, 2022. Thank you so much, Trustee Mutala. Do you wish to speak to your motion? No, thank you. Thank you. And seeing no one else in queue, I will ask, uh, do you wish to close your motion? No, I'm good. Thanks. Thank you so much. I'll now call the vote beginning with the same protocol as earlier. Trustee Harris, go ahead, please. I am in favor, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Engel. In favor, Madam Chair. Thank you. Trustee Mutala. I'm in favor, Madam Chair. Thank you. Vice Chair Tuchansky. In favor, Madam Chair. Thank you. Trustee Taber. In favor, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I am also in favor. Uh, for the record, please note the motion to approve today's agenda as circulated is carried. And as the agenda has been approved, 1.5 consent, uh, consent items, 1.5.1 human resources services report and all recommendations contained therein have also been approved. And so we will now move on to approval of the minutes 1.6.1. And we are looking for a motion to approve the minutes of our regular board meeting of January 26, 2022. And I do see Trustee Engel in queue. Go ahead, please. I move that we approve the minutes of the last meeting as presented. Thank you very much, Trustee Engel. Uh, do you wish to speak to your motion? No. And I'll, I'll grant you the same courtesy. Do you wish to close your motion? No, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And once again, calling the vote, beginning with Trustee Harris. Go ahead, please. In favor, Madam Chair. Thank you. Trustee Engel? In favor, Madam Chair. Thank you. Trustee Mutella? I'm in favor, Madam Chair. Thank you. Vice Chair Tuchansky? In favor, Madam Chair. Thank you. Trustee Taber? In favor, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I am also in favor. For the record, please note the motion is carried. And as there are no minutes arising from the, mi the minutes, uh, we will move on to 1.7 presentations. We take pleasure to welcome two presenters this afternoon. I would like to remind the speakers of the three minute time limit for your presentation. Each of you has already been made aware uh, that to assist you in keeping with your presentation within the time limit, a bell will sound at the two minute 30 second mark. And as a, as a reminder to all of you to start wrapping up and then one twice at the three minute mark to signal that time is up. We thank you all in advance uh, for adhering to this. And um, at this time, I invite Ms. Jennifer Grant to turn on your camera and begin your presentation to the board. All right, hopefully everybody can see me. Can you hear me okay? We can, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair and Honorable Trustees. My name is Jenny Grant and my child is in grade eight at Our Lady of Mount Carmel, and that's why I'm presenting today. So aside from parenting three teenagers, I work in public consultation stakeholder relations for Alberta's housing sector, and analyzing data is a huge part of my job. And I thank you very much for the information that has been pr provided to date regarding the possible closure of Mount Carmel's junior high. However, I'm not convinced that the process has been thorough enough for you and that all pot potential data sets have been collected. Enrollment numbers have been concerning. However, 
stats reflect reputational challenges due to frequent changes in principles at the school, and the pandemic has made it impossible for the school to stabilize enrollment and recover. In our info session and table talks, we were told that while no decisions have been made yet, our kids are expected to attend Louis or St. Brendan next year. And the phrase traditional junior high experience was used repeatedly kind of as a sales pitch for these schools. This kind of shows some research bias and might be implying a divisional preference. So I was left questioning whether the study has been impartial and if all the avenues to keep the junior high program at Mount Carmel have thoroughly been explored. There are far more than 87 kids affected by your decision today. Students and parents have chosen Mount Carmel for the K-9 environment as well as for the academies. So by erasing the junior high program, every single student at the school is going to be affected as well as the families in the area that will need the program soon. There are no Catholic options in adjoining neighborhoods. A qualitative data analysis has not properly been completed for you and assurance surveys, they're more a passive mechanism for feedback on satisfaction. Consultation best practices utilize conversation and two-way dialogue, and consultants should report back on everything they collected from the stakeholders back to the stakeholders for validation. And this was not a proper engagement. I have not yet read a report on how many students are thriving emotionally and mentally at Mount Carmel, nor have I heard about quality indicators or what research methodologies are being used to make your decisions. People value having options. And in the seniors housing sector, we know that uh, we need smaller buildings for those that don't feel comfortable in larger settings. And there's no cookie cutter approaches. It's the same for schools. The children at Mount Carmel are there not because they want a smaller school culture, they actually need it for their learning, mental health and comfort. And a system without options always fails Albertans. I'm asking you today to please afford Mount Carmel seven to nine, two more years, similar to what was granted to St. Basil, to promote her programs to reach targets that appear so important to you. And I assure you the school is already meeting the targets that are important to the students and families served, the targets that I haven't yet seen in reports. And I agree more Edmontonians need to discover this gem. And I assure you that this school has so much potential to thrive without the threat of a closure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Grant. Uh, I will now turn it to the board. Trustees, do any of you have uh, questions of clarification uh, of Ms. Grant? And seeing no one in queue, uh, thank you very much, Ms. Grant. The board appreciates the time and effort you put into this presentation. I now invite our second speaker, uh, Dr. Joel Semenuk, to turn on your camera and begin your presentation to the board. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Joel Semenuk. I'm a pediatrician and parent at Our Lady of Mount Carmel. OMC K-9 is an awesome school and the district, school staff and families should all be proud of its unique environment. In recent weeks, you and I have listened to students, families and community members highlight how the school suits people, whether it was the right class size, proximity to home or work, sports academies, stability during crisis, less bullying, elementary junior high combination or that special feeling we heard about so often. We've heard from many students and families that their education needs are being met here. OMC K-9 school fulfills its purpose. Families continue to choose it over other available options and we need to keep it as one. In January, we watched your board enthusiastically approve new school codes. We read the announcement of the Joan Carr School with Features, and I quote, to keep neighborhoods together, to limit the amount of time it takes to walk, bike, or drive to school, to minimize the impact of attendance area changes, and to allow for future growth, end quote. That's precisely the features of OLMC K-9 and what helps make it a great school. It's really as if you've modeled a proposed school on one that's already open. Your board should be just as excited to maintain an existing school, freshly renovated, that already has the desired features and is suited to its community and students. OLMC K-9 is not two distinct uh, divisions. It's a single school, a family, and it works. Cutting it apart will make the whole school die. Thank you for listening to everyone in this consultation. Listen to 87% of respondents who somewhat or strongly oppose closure of OLMC K-9. 
Honor our voices by choosing to keep OLMC K-9 alive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Semenuk. Uh, I will now open it up to the board. Trustees, do you have any questions of clarification uh, for Dr. Semenuk? Just watching the queue there and seeing none. Once again, we'd like to thank you, Dr. Semenuk, for sharing your thoughts and feedback today. The board is most appreciative of your presentation and efforts. And on behalf of the board, I would like to once again thank our presenters today, uh, both Ms. Grant and Dr. Semenuk, for sharing their insights this afternoon. Your efforts, as always, are much appreciated. And this now takes us to business of the meeting, beginning with 2.1, Our Lady of Mount Carmel Catholic Elementary Junior High School, school closure proposal, and I will turn it over to you, Chief Superintendent Martin. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and uh, Board of Trustees. And so to begin our uh, first presentation this afternoon, I would ask on uh, Superintendent Fiaco uh, to uh, be present and he has his team with us uh, this afternoon. And so, Superintendent Fiaco, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chief Superintendent Martin, Madam Chair, through the Board of Trustees. Uh, this presentation will contain two parts. Uh, Christine Meadows, Manager of uh, Communications and Engagement, will present her part in terms of uh, what we heard over the past 13 weeks. And then I'll take it from there. So I'll turn it over to Christine Meadows right now. Thank you, John. I'm just going to get my presentation going. Okay, first off, we want to thank everyone who contributed to the public participation process regarding the possible closure of the junior high program at Our Lady of Mount Carmel Catholic Elementary Junior High School. We know this feedback was essential for you, the Board of Trustees, in your decision making. In alignment with the Education Act and Policy 14 school closure, we have held multiple public meetings to provide the opportunity for the public to respond to the school closure proposal. Historically, in Edmonton Catholic schools, stakeholders have been given the opportunity to respond to the proposal at one single town hall style meeting. By offering a virtual information session coupled with our comprehensive and regularly updated website, that includes answers to questions posed by stakeholders in a frequently asked questions document, followed by a series of six smaller virtual meetings that were all open for registration and public participation, we have provided an increased opportunity for the public to respond to the proposal. As a result of the COVID-19 situation in January, the virtual format was such that members of the public could respond in a comfortable and safe setting where everyone who wanted to speak at the public meetings, not just those who were comfortable speaking in front of a large audience, had the opportunity to do so. We prioritized inclusivity, equity, and accessibility. Public participation opened on December 15th when an email went out to all ECSD families notifying them of the engagement opportunities for stakeholders to respond to the proposal. It's also when we began accepting written, email, phone, and video submissions, and it was when our survey opened. We accepted feedback for nearly six weeks. Furthermore, 13 weeks have now passed since the date of the school closure proposal notice of motion and today. That exceeds the requirement in policy 14 by one week. There's an overview of the feedback we received. There were 153 com completed surveys, 55 total emails from 33 unique senders, 73 members attended the live information session on January 20th, and to date, the recording of that information session, which was posted on YouTube the following morning, now has more than 120 views. During our six table talks, 59 people attended. In reviewing our attendance records, there were 48 unique participants. We received no video submissions, and we received two phone calls providing feedback. In taking a closer look at the online survey, a large number of the respondents who filled out a survey did not identify as parents of OLMC or another ECSD school. The combination of other, a community or local business, or a community member accounted, accounted for 43% of survey respondents. These respondents identified themselves as former students, family members of current and former students, and members of the local community around the school. 48% said they were parents of OLMC, 
Another 9% indicated they were parents at another ECSD school. Respondents were asked to rate their level of support of or opposition to the proposed closure, where one is strongly opposed and five is strongly supportive. About 87% said they were strongly or somewhat opposed, 10% said they were strongly or somewhat supportive, and 3% said they were neutral. Of the 132 respondents who were strongly or somewhat opposed to the closure of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, 52% were parents and guardians of a student at OLMC, in other words, 66 parents, 5% were parents and guardians at another ECSD school, and a combined 43% were made up of other community or local business and community members. Of the 16 respondents who were strongly or somewhat supportive of the closure of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, they were made up of the following groups. 25% identified as parents or guardians of OLMC, 31% were parents or guardians of another ECSD school, and a combined 44% were made up of other community or local business and community members. Our table talks for Our Lady of Mount Carmel occurred over two days with multiple times for people to attend. Each table talk lasted one hour and was attended by two trustees, two members of our senior leadership, and either our chief superintendent or deputy superintendent. There were 59 total participants over those six hours. In reviewing attendance records, four people attended two table talks and one person attended three and one person attended all six table talks, resulting in 48 unique participants. For stakeholders who were unable to attend a table talk session, we accepted emails, written, and video submissions. Email was the most popular form of feedback. We received 55 emails from 33 unique senders. In all, including the survey and table talks, we received a total of 269 submissions of feedback. That number includes individuals who shared their feedback on multiple occasions. I will now pass things to John Fiacco, Superintendent of Educational Planning, for more on what we heard. John? Thank you, Christine. Thanks for your report on the data collected by the engagement framework. <clears throat> the data included comments provided by the public via multiple conduits. From that data, several themes emerged. The themes can be summarized as follows. There is a strong desire to keep the building a K-9 school. The impact of COVID on the school closure proposal and on the mental health of the students. The changes to transportation and the impacts on enrollment the lack of time that the school has had to meaningfully increase enrollment, programming options at Arlene Mont Carmel, and the financial challenges associated with the operations of the school. It is important to note that we did receive feedback from parents that expressed concerns with the low enrollments and the impacts that this was having on the educational opportunities available to students at OLMC. These parents indicated they were looking forward to the possible relocation of sport academies to a site where students would have access to additional options and a more typical junior high experience. Let's look at each of these common themes further. One of the themes was the need for the school to remain at K-9 now and in the future. Participants in the table talk sessions shared that relationships between older and younger kids were very important and play a significant role in building a sense of community within the school. More than half of our schools in ECSD are K-6 elementary schools that require students to transition into grade 7 after their time at the school is complete. Each of those schools have built a sense of community and have made significant impacts in the community and the lives of their students. Each year, many students leave behind a younger sibling as they graduate into junior high. Although we appreciate the convenience afforded by having the siblings in the same school, it is not the main driver of creating a sense of school community. Many factors are responsible for successfully fostering a sense of community and fostering relationships between students. And the division is confident, based on the diversity of our programming configurations, that the school community and student relationships will continue to remain strong and vibrant as a K-6 school. Another reoccurring theme that arose as we gathered feedback 
was the effects of the pandemic on the enrollment decline. Now we understand that COVID has been difficult on everyone. And when making recommendations of gravity, ECSD analyzes trends over an extended period of time. It's important to remember that the recommendation to consider the closure of the Our Lady of Mount Carmel Junior High School is not rooted in COVID-19 factors, but rather the fact that the school met four out of the seven closure consideration factors. The enrollment issues at the school and the operational challenges existed well before the pandemic started and continues to this day. Student enrollment at the school and the operational challenges that exist with full enrollment existed before the pandemic started, making it difficult to offer a viable program. Since 2016, enrollment at Our Lady of Mount Carmel Junior High has decreased by 56%, despite robust marketing efforts. And there is no indication that enrollment in the junior high program will increase. Since 2016, the school has seen 217 less students register in the school. This trend started well before the pandemic started. The red numbers illustrate the enrollment drop per grade. Over the past five years, 112 students chose not to go into their next grade level at the school. Further analysis of this table reveals that when we look at the 2019-20 registration intake, which was just prior to the pandemic, we find that Our Lady of Mount Carmel lost 63 students for that school year. Once again, the enrollment issues at the school, and the operational challenges existed before the pandemic started and continue to this day. But as we drill down, we focus in on the junior high enrollment figures, because that's what the proposal is for us for the junior high closure. When we look at those figures, we notice that most of the red numbers occur during the junior high years. And overall, since 2016, we saw a drop of 117 students in the junior high. And then when we analyze the retention rate between grades over the past five years, we also notice a significant pattern. And I just want to draw your attention to the to the screen here. And what we do here is we look from year to year at a, on a diagonal. So if we take this number at 45 in the year 2016, 17 and grade six, how many students went into grade seven? Well, we lost one. And then the following year, we lost two. And then this was a big drop. The following year, we lost 14. So when we analyze those numbers, we found, find that since 2016, 17 year, six students chose not to register between grade six and seven. This number jumps to 33 students as they transition from grade seven to grade eight. And then 41 students choosing to leave the school after their grade eight year rather than registering in grade nine. These figures total up to 80 students that did not transition into the next grade while they were in junior high. Making matters even worse is that students who remain till the end of grade nine at Our Lady Mount Carmel choose to leave the division as two out of every three students transitioning into high school leaves ECSD after their grade nine year. Other feedback received with respect to the pandemic affecting enrollment mentioned that the online school that was created was a contributor to the decline in enrollment. The pandemic did create an online school offering that had the potential to take students away from our brick and mortar sites. And this fact was acknowledged at the information session. And as we noted then, only two junior high students are currently registered at the online school. Another common theme from the feedback received centered around the mental health and well being of students that will have to move schools for junior high. The pandemic has affected many students in ECSD, and as such, the division has allocated a number of resources to support students' mental health. In the event of the junior high program closure, the division is committed to working with affected students and their families to support the positive transition to one of the two relocation junior high schools. And the Catholic Schools is committed to providing an inclusive, welcoming, caring, respectful, safe and Catholic environment that promotes the well-being of all and fosters community support for all student mental health. There are many comments and concerns shared about the effects of the proposed changes to transportation and how it is detrimental to the students. When 
we look at the physical distance between the alternate sites, we see that Louis Saint Laurent is located 5.3 kilometers from Our Lady Mount Carmel, and Saint Brendan is located 7.2 kilometers from OLMC. Currently, transportation to OLMC has one dedicated bus route, and in total, ECSD transports 64 of the 240 students to Our Lady Mount Carmel. This dedicated yellow bus route will continue to serve the K-6 students and the projected ride time will be reduced from 22 minutes to 16 minutes. Also, it is important to note that the current average yellow bus ride time for the 64 students is approximately 28 minutes one way. This is slightly higher than the division average of 20 minutes. And when we look at the impact on ride times for each school, we can summarize the impact on average ride times as follows. Elementary students needing transport to Arlene Mount Carmel will see their ride times reduced by six minutes from the current 22 minutes to 16 minutes. Junior high students needing transport to Louis Saint Laurent would see an average increase of eight minute ride times from the current 28 minute average to 36 minutes. Junior high students going to St. Brendan would also see an increase of eight minutes. And as I mentioned earlier in the information session, there is net zero effect on the financial costs on transportation. Many questions were asked about the proposed changes to transportation throughout the engagement process. Stakeholders were concerned what the relocation of the junior high program would do to transportation for the students. For students needing access to Louis Saint Laurent, yellow bus transportation will not be provided. These students will access already established ETS school routes that safely transport thousands of students to Louis Saint Laurent and Harry Ainley on a daily basis. Instead of being on a 28 minute yellow bus ride, junior high students would have an ETS ride time that ranges from 21 minutes to 45 minutes, depending on where you live, with an average ride time of 36 minutes. For students who attend St. Brendan for junior high, the yellow bus transportation will be made available for all eligible students. And the predicted average ride time would be 36 minutes, which is eight minutes longer than they currently experience traveling to Our Lady Mount Carmel. In the feedback that was received, the issue of timing was brought up that the community didn't know and wanted more time to increase awareness and enrollment. The division has taken numerous measures to support the school to increase enrollment, such as the introduction of kindergarten with full day programming, investing over $32,000 in marketing initiatives over the past six years, increasing the attendance boundary, thereby making the Arley Mount Carmel boundary one of the biggest catchment areas in the division. We engaged with the school community in October of 2020. And at that time, we notified the community that we were concerned with the enrollment and needed to create a draw to the school. On consultation with the community, we implemented the Enhanced Academic Program for junior high students. This was in part in response to parents advising us they wanted the school to be known for something more than its sport academies. Now, generally, programs do take time to grow. However, it is also expected that we see growth and in interest as new programs are introduced. During the first year of implementation, we saw little uptake in the interest within the EAP program. The current enrollment within the program has 17 students spread out over three grades. Out of the 17 students interested in EAP, 15 of them are also registered in an academy, which requires them to be off the school site every afternoon. This causes a program challenge for the school. The challenge of creating an EAP academic focus can be illustrated in this table that shows class configurations during the school day. As we can see, we have three healthy class sizes in the AM, where students have access to the five core subjects within the division. However, in the afternoon, only 30 students remain on campus. Currently, these 30 grades 7, 8, 9 students are combined into one class and take physical education, health, academic core enrichment, art, or computer technology. And when we consider that 15 out of the 17 EAP students are also in an academy and leave campus in the afternoon, 
This leaves the school with two EAP students out of the 30 students that remain behind every afternoon. It is challenging to create an academic focused school when the numbers and interests are this low. And if we analyze the enrollment trends over the past five years, we find that the average enrollment at Arleigh Mount Carmel Junior High has decreased by 23 students annually. Despite the introduction of the enhanced academic program during the 2021-2022 school year, junior high enrollment again decreased by 23 students. No factors that would indicate that enrollment in the junior high program will increase if the school was simply provided additional time. Participants asked if there was a possibility to phase out the junior high program rather than closing all three grades. Arlene Mount Carmel's low junior high enrollment does not make it feasible to phase out the junior high program over three years. If the junior high program was phased out, the junior high would only have 63 students in grade eight and nine for the 2022-2023 school year. And that's assuming all students presently registered returned. Feedback from the table talk sessions told us that parents of students presently enrolled in grade seven pl plan on leaving the school and the division if the Hockey Academy is not relocated to Louis Saint Laurent. If this indeed occurs, the projected enrollment of 63 students would be even lower. Furthermore, there are currently 35 students in grade seven and using historical retention rates, we could expect that two years from now, the grade seven class size to be 18 to 25 students. These enrollment numbers do not support phasing out the junior high program as a viable option. And if the decision is made today to close and relocate the junior high program at Our Lady Mount Carmel, and the Catholic Schools is committed to working with all affected families to ensure a smooth transition. We received feedback that the school closure proposal in relation to Our Lady Mount Carmel was unfairly influenced by the concurrent announcement by the division that new academies were being created simultaneously at Louis Saint Laurent and St. Brendan. This left some parents with the impression that the closure of the junior high program at Our Lady Mount Carmel was already decided by the division before the engagement process was started. The letter that was sent to Louis Saint Laurent Junior Senior High School parents indicated that the enhanced academic program and advanced placement program would be implemented at Louis Saint Laurent to replace the outgoing international baccalaureate programs this change had no bearing on the decision to recommend the closure of the junior high program at Our Lady Mount Carmel. The current EAP program at Our Lady Mount Carmel will not be offered in 2022-2023, regardless of the decision made on February 23rd, 2022. Furthermore, the announced soccer academy at Louis Saint Laurent is being implemented at the high school level to complement the existing high school hockey academy. We respect, with respect to the letter sent home to St. Brendan families. The Golf Academy currently offered at St. Brendan Catholic Elementary Junior High School will be replaced with a Recreation Academy in September 2022 that offers more diverse opportunities for current students to be involved in the Academy. This change has no bearing on the decision to recommend the closure of the Junior High program at Our Lady Mount Carmel. The Recre Recreation Academy will be offered at St. Brandon Catholic Elementary Junior High, regardless of the decision made by the board today. A comment that was received through the engagement process was a concern that kindergarten numbers were capped at 25 for this year. We would like to address this question by stating, every resident student that wanted to register in kindergarten at Our Lady Mount Carmel for the 2021-2022 school year is currently registered at the school. No resident student wanting access to full day kindergarten was denied acceptance. This, com this comment came up through the engagement process. However, this has no bearing on the issue at hand, which is the closure of the junior high program. During the engagement process, questions were raised regarding the division's financial investment in the school infrastructure, particularly considering the deficit position that the school is in regarding its operations. Participants offered to volunteer and fundraise 
to cut the costs to keep the junior high program viable. When it comes to the division's decisions to invest in school infrastructure, provincial funding is provided to all school jurisdictions for the maintenance and operation of school buildings to ensure they are safe, comfortable, and suitable learning environments for children. Regardless of the school's utilization rates, the division remains committed to providing all students with enhanced learning environments, including those at Arlie and Mount Carmel. Since this, funding, since this funding is directed by the province to be used on school infrastructure and not school operations, when the opportunity was identified at Our Lady Mount Carmel to provide current students with an enhanced learning environment, the division invested accordingly. We truly appreciate the collaborative spirit of the school community, but the division is not able to rely upon volunteers to supplement staffing requirements and associated costs necessary to operate a school. While fundraising is an integral part of a school's operations, gaming funds raised are only able to be used for supplemental resources and not for the lion's share of the costs associated with the operation of a school. As a result, fundraising dollars would not have a significant enough impact on the overall financial assessment of OLMC's viability. Furthermore, by placing the responsibility on parents to fundraise to support the operations of a school, we are creating a privatized version of public education. And finally, while we appreciate parent engagement and support in these situations, our experience shows that additional time that allows for parent engagement does not have an impact on school viability. Although there's a potential for $100,000 in savings if our lay Mount Carmel to close and cost effectiveness is one of the four factors in our decision to recommend the closure of the junior high program, Financial impact is not the main driver of the recommendation to close the junior high. Our main focus is to provide the best learning experiences for all our students, including the Our Lady Mount Carmel Junior High students. During the engagement process, the division did receive feedback from parents that expressed concerns with the low enrollments and the impact that this was having on the educational opportunities available to the students at Our Lady Mount Carmel. Additionally, some feedback also expressed that the current junior high class sizes are too small. These parents indicated they were looking forward to the possible relocation of sport academies to a site where students would have access to additional options and a more typical junior high experience. Additionally, these same contributors expressed that the small junior high school has impacted students socially and that a junior high as small as Arlene Mount Carmel does not offer the diversity of interactions necessary as part of a student's educational experiences. Part of policy 14 involves the opportunity for the City of Edmonton to provide feedback on the impacts of the school closure to the community. The City of Edmonton submitted a community impact statement on January 17, 2022. The City of Edmonton impact statement speaks of the City's vision of communities and the aspirational goal that Edmontonians live in a 15-minute district where they can meet their daily needs without having to travel far. As stated in the Community Impact Statement document, this is a high-level strategic goal and is not to be understood as a hard and fast quantitative measure, but rather a qualitative state. With the school remaining open and the enhanced academic offerings at the school, ECSD is confident that the community will remain vibrant as we plan on the continuation of joint use access for the community. Decisions such as the one before us today are not made lightly and would not be proposed if there were not clear benefits to our students and their learning experiences. In offering the junior high students at Our Lady Mount Carmel the opportunity to attend an established, viable and sustainable junior high program at St. Brendan or Louis Saint Laurent and introducing an academic focus for the elementary students at Our Lady Mount Carmel, we see the following benefits for our children. Enhanced learning opportunities for all the Our Lady Mount Carmel Junior High students. Access to a consistent grade seven to 12 program for our academy students. And a retention of students within ECSD through to grade 12. An investment in facility and technology enhancements for Our Lady Mount Carmel students. We 
create an academic-focused elementary program that will attract more of the community residents who bypass Our Lady Mount Carmel to access it elsewhere. There will be cost savings and efficiencies for Our Lady Mount Carmel, and there will be no added expenditures for transportation. Madam Chair, through the trustees, it is with this, all these benefits in mind, the administration continues to support the recommendation brought forward on November 24th, 2021. I'll now I'll hand it back to Chief Superintendent Martin. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Fiaco. And uh, just one, just one, uh, one piece of information that I want to uh, recognize and acknowledge before making the official recommendation is uh, I want to highlight uh, the staff and administration at Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Uh, they have been doing an outstanding job, understanding that they're, it's a small school and when there's a small school, uh, the staff have to work so much harder uh, to, to provide uh, similar, similar uh, programming and, uh, and instruction and activities that other larger schools uh, are able to provide. And uh, the, the parents love this school and that is thanks to the entire community and in fact, uh, the staff and administration at Mount Carmel. And so I, I just wanted uh, Madam Chair to, to give a shout out to, uh, to the wonderful staff at Mount Carmel. And uh, so I, uh, I read to you the recommendation that the Board of Trustees approves the closure of the junior high program located at Our Lady of Mount Carmel Catholic Elementary Junior High School, effective June 30th, 2022. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chief Superintendent Martin, Superintendent Fiaco, and Communications and Engagement uh, Services Manager Christine Meadows and your respective teams. As this is a motion, and I do see Vice Chair Tuchansky in queue, I will turn it to you, Vice Chair Tuchansky, to please make this motion. Oops, sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to move that the Board of Trustees approves the closure of the Junior High Program located at Our Lady of Mount Carmel Catholic Elementary Junior High High School, effective June 30th. 2022. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Do you wish to speak to your motion? I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank Chief Superintendent Martin, Superintendent Fiaco, and his team for bringing this forward. The decision to close the school or program is never taken lightly, and the impact that it will have on families and the community is always considered. So are the benefits and the drawbacks for keeping a program that is no longer viable. Sometimes hard decisions need to be made in order to the, ensure the long-term success of a school in its community. I want to thank families, students, and community members who took the time out of their busy schedules to talk to us about the impact that the proposed junior high program closure would have on them. It was highly impactful listening to everybody share their stories and their reasons for keeping the junior high school open. I want you to know that I listened, I read, and I reread over the course of the last number of weeks, and then I reflected for a very, very long time. I'm very familiar with Our Lady of Mount Carmel and its community. In fact, I went there from St. Augustine Elementary School because Karshay McGee didn't offer grade seven, and that was the school we were directed to go to for junior high. So I understand how it feels to walk down the hallways, go into the classrooms, tell stories about all the dark nooks and the crannies that a school built almost 100 years ago has. The crazy stuff we would tell our friends just to freak each other out were the stuff legends were made of. In fact, we'd bet each other who could stay longest in the basement bathroom with the lights turned off. I did a lot of praying down there in the dark trying to win that bet. I love this school and I treasure my days there. I remembered it so fondly that when my oldest daughter was going into grade seven, we seriously considered having her attend our Lady of Mount Carmel for junior high. We went to the open house along with so many of her peers, but even then we could see his parents where the school was headed. That was 2017 and they were already struggling with enrollment. I wanted my daughter to have a full junior high experience. So we decided to enroll her at Louis Saint Laurent. It's with this knowledge of what a full junior high experience looks like 
that I concur with the decision of our division. The opportunity to maximize our students' learning experience is critical. To have 30 non-academy students participate in combined afternoon classes creates so many challenges. I believe that by relocating these students, it would bring them more opportunities and a true junior high experience filled with a variety of options and choices. In addition to our non-academy students, our academy students will flourish having a greater school population base to draw from for years to come. The facilities, the fields and the programs are extraordinary and the addition of Spark Academy to Louie will be a fit for students coming from STEM elementary schools. I understand the trepidation, challenges and emotions that come with the proposed closure of Our Lady of Mount Carmel School, but I have every confidence that this is the right move for this school and its community. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair Tuchansky, for your impactful words and for sharing your experience. She took me down some of those dark uh, alleyways that she's been referencing. So thank you. They were quite incredible. Uh, I do see Trustee Harris in queue. So at this time, I will open it up to the board. Trustee Harris, go ahead, please. Well, Madam Chair, I, I very much appreciate what uh, Trustee Juchansky has just shared. Um, I I did have a, a, a sort of a, a, it might be kind of a technical question on this particular motion, and I just would like to get uh, some feedback from administration on this one. And that is that uh, I, both this and the St. Basil uh, motions that we see before us today are unlike the school closure motions that we've uh, had placed before us and passed both the St. Gabriel in 2019 and the earlier St. Basil proposal in 2020 and that they don't refer to what happens with the students, the, the motions themselves don't, don't refer to what happens with the students of the programs after the proposed uh, closures if uh, one or both of those closures are approved. And I'm wondering why that is and uh, wouldn't it be uh, prudent to have uh, something like that included in these motions? For our consideration as we did in those cases in the case of uh our lady of mount carmel uh should the motion include something in relation to the recommendation from administration regarding louis saint laurent and saint brendan in the case of saint basil with students and programs based at that site both students of the polish program and students of our genesis uh, school uh, should the motion somehow be more specific uh, as they have in past so it's a question to administration uh, thank you very much, Trustee uh, Harris. Uh, I, I believe that as the board had not made a decision, it would be pr a preliminary uh, assumption on our part to move forward with your with your request. But that being said, I will turn it to you, Chief Superintendent Martin, to please address Trustee Harris's uh, question. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through to Trustee Harris, uh, we have not included those pieces within the motion. Uh, Clearly for Our Lady of Mount Carmel, we do have a plan in place for the students uh, wanting to continue in junior high, which would be St. Brendan and Louis Saint Laurent. As far as uh, St. Basil, uh, we, uh, we do not have uh, anything in, in, pl in place right now because we're awaiting the, uh, the results of this meeting. And so once that is done, rest assured, we will have a very robust and thorough plan for all of our students because they are our students if we, uh, if the board chooses to close St. Basil. If they don't uh, close St. Basil, again, uh, we will meet, we will have a thorough plan in place uh, to take care of our students and our families at St. Basil. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Superintendent Martin. I trust Trustee Harris that you're satisfied with that answer. And so I'll move along in queue then. And I do see Trustee Tiber in queue. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so th thank you, Trustee Chirachansky, for sharing your experiences with the nooks and crannies. Um, you know, our elementary students, I'm sure, will live on that tradition as those students are still going to be there. They're still going to be roaming the halls and creating a whole bunch of new memories and, um, I don't know, interesting stories, I'm sure, to tell. Um, so I also really, really, really want to thank all who participated in our process. Um, I know it's hard. I know change is hard and I know that no one wants to consider a process. Oh, Trustee Tiber, I believe you're frozen. That presents. Can you hear me now? 
Yes, I can. Yeah, I just can wanted to make sure we did. We can hear you. Can you hear okay. us? Yeah, I can hear you. Where did where, okay. where did I cut go off? Ahead. <laughs> you know what? Okay. You may want to go a couple of sentences back. Oh, okay, let me see. Um, yeah, so I just want to say, you know, no one wants to um, consider a process like this. Um, change is hard. And I really want to appreciate and thank all the passion and the heartfelt messages, uh, emails, uh, conversations through our table talks um, that were shared during this process. Um, I found that, anyways, I want to, I just want to thank everybody. I know it's hard and I want to, I do support this motion. Am I frozen? No. Okay. I do, I do support this motion and oh, you're frozen now. This is an amazing opportunity. Now, now, um, you know what? I'm going to put myself on mute. It could be me. Uh, if we can all make sure that we're on mute, maybe we're taking up too much bandwidth here. Let's see if that helps her out. Now, can you hear? That's no, not a good time for my internet to go down. Is this good? You're fine, Trustee Tabir. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say I do support this motion. Um, it's an amazing opportunity for our junior high students. But as a trustee, um, I am responsible for the education system that is organized and operates in the best interest of our students, but also has a wise use of our resources. All the reasons that our administration presented with the enrollment issues, uh, the factors that are not working with the school, as well as the transportation costs. This is all really difficult to be able to operate a school and to keep the school in a in operating in a way that is organized for our students in the best interest of the learning environment. Um, but that being said, you know, not only our current students, but potentially future students that will be joining Edmonton Catholic that have the opportunity to join Louis St. LeBron or to join St. Brendan's and to have that junior high experience, I think is something that we hope that all the families and all the students do continue with a Catholic education in the best interest of your family and to share and experience everything that you can uh, from a junior high perspective. I also really do want to thank administration, I mean, for doing a very difficult job in bringing this motion forward for consideration, just bringing it forward for consideration. It's not the fun part of your job. It's not the fun part of the responsibilities that you hold within the division, but it is something that the Board of Trustees does ask of you in order to have these conversations. So for that, as a trustee, I do respect that and I want to thank you, but I also do support the motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. And sorry for the internet. No, I'll, uh, thank you very much, Chatea Jaber, uh, for your heartfelt words. Uh, don't apologize for the internet. That's beyond our control. And, and thank you, uh, you, you for concurring, uh, something that we're all uh, very, very um, uh, having a difficult time with. So thank you very much. Uh, next in queue is Trustee Mutala. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Trustee Chertansky, for sharing all your experiences at this lovely old school. It is a beautiful old school. <clears throat> I just want to say as a parent and former teacher and now a trustee, I want to say it's very hard for all of us to make a decision like this. It's hard on the schools, it's hard on the community. I want to thank Chief Superintendent Martin and Superintendent Fiaco and all the admin team for all their hard work that they have done. I listened to everyone. I read all the information reports and submissions and I thank everyone for submitting and participating in the engagement process. Our Lady of Mount Carmel is a beautiful, well-kept Catholic school. And Edmonton Catholic Schools has put a lot of extra money into the renovations and maintenance of the school and helped to balance the budget. Since 2016, despite strong efforts by Edmonton Catholic Schools and the community, we have seen the enrollment decrease by 48%. And the sad part is of, as of September 2021, when you have the academy students in their chosen sports classes in the afternoon, there's only 30 grade seven, eight, and nine students present to participation to participate in combined option courses. As a former teacher, I know that this staffing, this 
create staffing challenges and scheduling limitations. And this puts a strain on the administration and teachers who are there to try to provide maximum learning ex opportunities and extra optimal junior high experiences for these 30 junior high school children. Uh, Our Lady of Mount Carmel demonstrated four of the seven factors that can lead to a closure of a school. By relocating the junior high program, Edmonton Catholic School would save over $100,000 per year. And I know some of you don't think that $100,000 isn't very much, but I have a lot of schools in my ward that are in inner city and they could desperately use some of that money that we have been putting into the school because they are trying hard to feed and clothe our children and do all these extra programs for our children in those areas as well. So my duty as a trustee is to be fiscally responsible for all 96 schools in Edmonton Catholic schools. That's what I signed on for. And to make, that, make sure that all students will receive the best and maximum learning opportunities at a larger school that will provide a variety of options, art, drama, and sports activities. So considering all these factors in mind, I also support the, program, uh, the motion to close the junior high program at Our Lady of Mount Car Carmel School. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee Mutella, for sharing your heartfelt words as well. Uh, Trustee Engel, you're next in queue. Go ahead, please. Yeah, this is a really difficult thing. I want to start out by thanking all the parents at Mount Carmel School for their diligence in coming to the community engagement. I want you to know that um, when someone's going to take something away that we love and we feel threatened, your actions have been admirable. You've worked very hard to, to put your case forward. And I think parents like you and all of you who have participated in the engagement should win some type of award because it is those lobby, lobby efforts for our children that make a community a, a good community. So I really want to start out by saying that. I also want to thank Superintendent Fiacco for his leadership on this. Um, this isn't easy. Uh, he has been nicknamed all sorts of things that aren't necessarily pleasant nicknames because when he has a school that isn't meeting the uh, seven sort of criteria for being viable in operating efficiently, it's his job to sort of ring the bell of bad news. So um, this is not a situation where it can ever be win-win, and I realize that. I also want to thank the teachers at Mount Carmel. Um, my husband's a retired teacher, my daughter's a junior high teacher, and I know how much time goes into the extracurricular. And being a parent of two children, I know how important that extracurricular is to the life of a child. So um, I guess what... what uh, I don't think this could ever be a win-win situation. I think we just make the best of going forward, and oftentimes it becomes a win-win situation. But when I balance my responsibility as a steward of the funds of, of our division, I balance my responsibility of being a top employer, uh, and our superintendent makes that happen by supervising staff and giving them work that they can manage. When I balance all of that, I have to make the decision that the program moving is a good one. Having said that, there are a few things that I see as lights in this. The first one is, is uh, I've been a trustee a really long time and we visited Mount Carmel on several occasions because it wasn't meeting the, the seven criteria. And those criteria are important because what they're telling Chief Superintendent Martin is, this is what a school needs to be viable and cost effective and operate efficiently in your district. So, so we have to some, you know, use them as our guide, not our only guide. And that's why we have to value the engagement that goes forward. But where I see that this is a win is we're not closing Our Lady of Mount Carmel School. Our Lady of Mount Carmel School is sort of across uh, in an isolated area. There are not a lot of Catholic schools in that area. And um, I know that in the conversations that I attended, a lot was talked about, about infill and building in that area and different businesses, you know, uh, that employ people that may want, want to drop their kids off there, that future viability did sound like something. 
And it's a little consolation to the children who were looking forward to going in September if the school closes. But it's a huge comp uh, consolation to the community to know that jewel that we're all talking about can be reopened. It's not closing its doors and it's not going to become something other than a Catholic school. Um, I know that I've offered little uh, consolation and I know I also have been long-winded in this, but I, I want you to know that everybody has worked extremely hard and taken every single suggestion to heart, has read the material, and I'm, I'm not going to leave here saying, oh, get excited, your kids are going to do this, they're going to do that. I hope you find that out as you place them in, in new programs. I really, truly do. But it's a decision I feel is necessary in fulfilling my obligations as an elected trustee to have this program move. Um, again, thank you to the parents and the students. The students who participated were marvelous. And one student that was participating seemed to just be growing. That's, that's sort of a, um, to me, that's kind of a, a, an absolute example of extracurricular. There was a student presenting, and of course, you're a little nervous, you're online, you're presenting to a board of trustees, you're in junior high. But as he presented and as the facilitator encouraged him, he grew into a regular politician and maybe he'll join the board and reopen this school in uh, 30 years. So thank you everyone for listening to my long diatribe, uh, but I will be supporting the motion to move the program. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Trustee Engel. Oh, I'm echoing. Am I still echoing? No. Okay, good. Okay, thank you, Trustee Engel. And you're right, this is never a win-win situation, but don't worry because long-windedness hasn't even happened yet. So uh, so just wait. <laughs> uh, I'm considering this uh, going into um, uh, round two and I will turn it back to you, Trustee Harris. Go ahead, please. Thanks very much, Madam Chair. I want to express my appreciation to all involved in uh, in, uh, in coming forward, uh, preparing and uh, in, uh, providing input to this uh, decision. Um, you know, when I think about it, uh, Madam Chair and colleagues, uh, you know, the division, as we all know, is is has an extremely important initiative underway called Walking Together Towards a, gear, a Glorious Future. And I, I support the initiative with its focus on finding opportunities and, yes, eliminating waste, you know, streamlining program flow delivery. And I accept that this is going to result in the elimination of some programs and closure of some underutilized schools. Uh, I would think about this in relation to both what we're talking about now and our next subject. It's, it's, it is extremely important that our programs and our schools, but for a few exceptions, be self-sustaining, particularly uh, when those uh, include programs of choice, that kind of thing. And I'm strongly in favor of that. And I, I want to thank administration for their diligent efforts in reviewing these important matters. At the same time, when we're contemplating changes of this nature, uh, really important to do that in a manner, I think, that builds our community, where we are, in fact, walking together with our community, not in spite of the views of our community. In the case of uh, Our Lady of Mount Carmel, the survey, uh, that survey alone garnered you know, many responses uh, and had a lot of responses from parents from different schools as well, not just Mount Carmel. And, you know, close to 90% of those opposed the proposal, with about seven times as many uh, division parents opposing the proposal uh, at this time as supporting it, about seven times as many. So that that weighs on me. And uh, and I, I, I definitely, uh, there's a very significant part of my thinking that says I want to support those 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 families in that community uh, that have expressed their concerns about this. What pulls me to the other side of this is uh, what uh, Superintendent Fiaco indicated, and that is that you know financial uh, imperative of this is is not the main driver. The financial impact and imperative of this proposal. And it really is about the junior high experience for those students. And when I hear that, uh, regardless of what this decision is going to be, that the EAP is not going to be offered at the school on a go-forward basis, when I hear the um, the commentary that I'm hearing coming from the 
folks in the sports academy, the hockey academy, the you know those academies uh, that uh, you know if this doesn't move, they're probably moving. Uh, it 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 causes me to think that you know the you know this this bell has has been rung. And when I take a look at the at the uh, at the precipitous drop in enrollment uh, in this particular situation, particularly over about the last five years, and it looks like it's, you know, as as high as it is for the school in general, it, it appears to be even higher uh, for the junior high. <clears throat> as I understand from from my from what I heard in the presentation, saw in the reports, you know, 117 students lower than it was uh, a few years ago. Stu school, if, if I'm not mistaken, if my addition's correct, is somewhere in the area of about uh, 91 junior high students now, about 117 junior high. Did I get that right uh, back a few years ago? So that's about a 56% drop in, in the junior high. The sense that I've got is, is um, uh, we have some other phenomenally good options for these students to carry forward on the path that they have, uh, they and their families are, are see uh, see the moving forward on their aspirations, uh, and uh, and uh, I think that I will uh, I will support, given you know all of those factors combined, um, this uh, proposal, and uh, and wish those students well, and uh, and uh, others have indicated, uh, and I agree, uh, tough decision. Uh, particularly given that it's taken at um, with, uh, I understand where the community is coming from, quite short notice, at least short in relation to this particular thing, although uh, Trustee Engel has indicated that this this has been communicated uh, before. So, uh, yeah, I, if I, long story short, I think, um, you know, given everything that's been mentioned about the programming and about the need for this, uh, these students to have a wonderful uh, junior high experience, um, I'm drawn to uh, to support this proposal at this time. Uh, thank you, Trustee Harris, for your um, your insight, your feedback, and your heartfelt words as well. Uh, so I see no one else uh, in queue for round two, and that uh, um, so I'm going to assume that um, uh, this is the opportunity for me, seeing no one else in queue, to insert myself at this point. I'd like to also share our sincere gratitude and appreciation to all of you, our parents, guardians, families, community members, our students, staff and administration, and our board for keeping the best interest of our students at the forefront of your decision making. We thank you. On behalf of the board, we thank you for your perseverance and courage because it does take courage for all of us to do what we are entrusted to do. From a division perspective, we continue to grow because of our pursuit of excellence. And from a parent and community perspective, you continue to expect that pursuit of excellence. I ask you to please indulge me. As the, pre as the preamble um, I will provide is long, but it is the one opportunity to share perspective and provide important context so that we can continue to value and appreciate our valued partnership as it is only through respectful and professional dialogue that we can continue to serve our students and division. Up until now, our role as trustees was to listen. And today is our opportunity to speak. So I thank you in advance for your indulgence. And I will offer my perception um, through a similar yet different lens, but one that is applicable to this afternoon's business. As we've heard time and time again these past few months, uh, Chief Superintendent, uh, not Chief Superintendent, but Superintendent Fiaco alluded to this earlier, the closure of a school program is never made lightly because it impacts community. And regardless of whether you are a parent, a guardian, a community member, uh, a family member, a student, administration, it has been somewhat of a difficult journey. When a decision of this magnitude comes forward, it only stands to reason that everyone from our community to our administration works diligently to share their perspective in what they believe is right, the right thing to do. Administration never want to bring forward recommendations such as this, and parents never want recommendations such as this to come forward. Administration and staff know what is right for the division 
and parents and families know what is right for their children. And as a board, we have toiled over all the information provided. And you know, it was interesting because as I was thinking about today and staring at the agenda, I realized how sometimes I need to be reminded about the bigger picture. And what precipitated this thinking for me was the fact that yesterday um, I went to listen to the speech uh, from the throne in preparation for the budget, which I will similarly do on Thursday. You're probably thinking, what does this have to do with anything? But the reason I'm bringing that up is because I realized that I was there because I wanted to hear about the impact it would have on Edmonton Catholic, which served as a good reminder for me because while we act for the greater good, government's mandate is different than mine. They need to think about the entire province. I need to think about our division. I'll never forget when I was teaching. My concern was the students I taught and my classroom. I advocated for them and for my classroom. When I became a department head, my focus changed. It suddenly became about the students I taught, my classroom, and the English department. When I went into administration, the concern quickly changed again, and it became that of the entire school. And when I got to Alberta Education, I was reminded by the ministry that while I was a product of Edmonton Catholic, my allegiance was to all schools and students across Alberta. And the reason it's important to share this perspective is because like me yesterday, who was thinking about how the budget would impact Edmonton Catholic, today's recommendation and decision is very similar to yesterday. Because for some of you, you may be here today because of the impact the decision will have on your school and children. But similarly, there may be others who may be invested in today's decision because it, will, it may also be impacting their school and children directly or indirectly. And then there are others who are here to determine how today's decision is going to impact the entire division. You know, COVID has taught us many things, but one thing that is relevant here today is that regardless of what I may think or what each of you may think, others have differing opinions. Such was the case whether it was, do we return to school in person or online? Do we wear masks? Uh, do we mandate masks for children and students or, or don't we? I can't even begin to express how many differing perspectives were shared with this board and with our administration. But what became difficult was how to make those hard decisions, keeping in mind that those decisions being made are never personal. And although today's ad agenda shows a recommendation for two schools, one of which we're currently discussing, the bottom line is that everyone's voice matters. Today's decision doesn't just impact one community school and its stakeholders. Today's decision impacts 96 schools and community stakeholders whose voices also matter. Despite that they may have differing opinions as everyone has a right to share their perspective. And while I'm not sharing mind boggling information that you're not aware of, it is an important perspective. Recently, and again, I'm, this is just another analogy. AHS and even our chief medical officer has made many decisions. It doesn't impact one patient, one clinic, one hospital, one school, one division. It impacted all of Alberta. When the city of Edmonton makes a decision, it doesn't impact one area of the city, but all of the city, as we all incur the costs. As I indicated earlier, these are but a few analogies for perspective purposes. But what I can tell you is the decisions that are being made today and the deliberations that we've that that have occurred from all of all of us our administration our board and especially our parents and our community have taken a toll on us all and regardless of what happens today it must be noted that all stakeholders shared their own perspectives and they are to be applauded for their advocacy and or fulfilling their roles with passion and great diligence and more importantly with respect to our parents, our families, our students, our community, we have observed, we've listened, we've deliberated everything you had to say. We have six trustees representing you here today. We didn't know what anyone was going to say today. Your passion and your diligence in keeping your school open is extraordinary and admirable. Much of the sharing was coupled with emotion, passion, and even frustration. And you know what? We wouldn't have expected anything less as you have a job to do and you are trying to save your school and we commend you on a job well done. 
But like all of you, our chief superintendent, Robert Martin, Superintendent Fiaco, administration and their team also have a job to do. And it was referenced here today by a couple of trustees. One of the ma many tasks that is expected of them is to annually provide this board with a fulsome and comprehensive review of how our schools are doing. And this includes the responsibility of balancing utilization, enhancing learning environments, improve operating costs. And with that review comes at times a recommendation such as today, one that we really don't want to hear. And I'm going to be so bold as to ask you to remove yourselves as parents, family, students, or community members, and think about this. Hypothetically, consider the consequences of what happens when you have a job to do. And I guess I'm asking you to put yourself in that role and ask yourself, if you had to make a decision and that decision was going to impact millions of public dollars and those public dollars would impact all of the stakeholders that you represent and perhaps even their future. And let's just say that when your job involves bringing forward a recommendation, but you know, deep in your heart, that, that recommendation, although accurate, is the one stakeholders may not want to hear. And so you propose a different recommendation because there are less problems that way. But now you're being questioned, not by parents and community of that school, because they'll be happy, but by government and colleagues and stakeholders from other schools. And you're unable to substantiate your recommendation. Then what? And so I ask you to please put yourself in the position of our administration and staff for a moment and think about the demands and expectations that is put on them and why the recommendation came forward in the first place. And because of their integrity and commitment to this division, they had to use things such as current and historical data, projections and budget. And based on this and other factors, they could not ignore what was expected of them. On the one hand, they have Alberta education imposing expectations regarding utilization. In fact, over the last few years, school boards are being held more accountable than ever before to ensure that dollars are being spent appropriately. And this utilization rate that continues to be talked about more and more than ever before becomes an important metric that has that has now tied to a portion uh, of the of the maintenance funding to how well the division utilizes spaces in schools. And yeah, and you know what? And this may be of no relevance to some people, but it is to our administration. And the reason adherence to this utilization is critical and why it is so relevant is because we cannot serve those neighborhoods um, also with students that may be bursting at the seams as there is only so much money. It is for this reason that all school divisions, ours included, submit a three-year capital plan to Alberta education that identifies the division's highest priority school facility requirements. But these priorities are futile. If our division budget is not reflective of everything Alberta education looks for, which was previously mentioned. A point in case that I am going to reference today is the North End High School that has been talked about for years. It was only after smart strategic planning and proving to the ministry that we are improving efficiencies and balancing utilization that this long sought out priority finally came to fruition. Now on the flip side of that, if as a division we were not held accountable and we still get dollars and schools and we need and, and we can still ensure that we can address our pressure points and still serve those neighborhoods that are, that are bursting or not bursting with students, we wouldn't have an issue because we wouldn't be held accountable, but that's not our reality. It's also important to share that the work plan and deliverables of our decisions are much more involved with many more nuances than may appear at the surface. And what it comes down to, and again, it was, it was already referenced to, is fiscal responsibility. The fiduciary duty we have to all the other 43,200 plus students, not four, not 40, not 400, but 43,200 plus students, their families, their communities, and staff who also hold the division accountable, perhaps through a different lens, and who have every right to ask similar questions, but they may differ. Why are we continuing to spend money on certain schools and taking surplus from others, which is how the question of equity comes into play? And then there's the board, who is now tasked with all of this, and must answer to all of this um, and make informed decisions 
based on the principles of equitable use of resources for all, as you've already heard, 43,200 plus ECSD students, staff, and schools. The consolation in all of this is that regardless of the personal attacks, and I, I know I heard that as well, that you know we're sometimes faced with because they're not decisions that we want to hear, decisions such as this continues to revolve around all students in the division which is why the opportunity to hear from our communities validates that the roles all stakeholders provide are critical so we can appreciate and understand the perspectives of all. The same goes for our schools. The principal has a role. The teacher has another role. The EAs have another. The custodial staff have another, but together, we're working together towards the same cause, which is to ensure that our students are receiving the best education possible. And so when we look at it through the lens of one another, we're blessed because we know that our students have many advocates, advocates who continue to serve them in their various roles. And the fact that we continue to professionally respect one another is of further value to our students. And so when it comes to Our Lady of Mount Carmel, I see a gem of a school, a school with heart and soul. I love small schools. My own children went to a small school and they loved it. I loved it as it is a place where everyone knows your name. I see integrity. I see pride and I see great parent advocacy. And as per usual, an amazing student body that we are extremely proud of. I sincerely appreciated what I heard as there were many compelling perspectives. I listened to my colleagues. I heard their uh, compelling reasons as to how they may or may not be more moving forward shortly. But what is most significant for me is the impact this is having on our students' education. So the rationale had to finally revolve on what was best for student, on, on, on student learning. It is a given that our preference is to keep all schools open, not close them. We're in the business of running schools. The more schools we have, the better, because it means we're serving more students. I believe that this board similarly all looked for a way and sought, like I did, the rationale to justify keeping Our Lady of Mount Carmel open. While Our Lady of Mount Carmel's decreasing enrollments and improving cost effectiveness were concerns, uh, as the school has struggled to balance their budgets over the years, and despite that the school has required supplemental funding over and above base funding in order to maintain operations, and although the division has cross-subsidized these costs, and despite the fact that the retention rate of students after grade nine is also problematic, is understandable as the majority of students are out of boundary. But this was something that I too could justify for just a little bit longer. What I couldn't justify and what was truly of great concern was the effectiveness of the program delivery, the kind of education delivery our students are receiving. With the academy students leaving to attend their sports programming in afternoons, the 30 students left behind are not receiving the optimal, well-rounded junior high experience that is expected of us. The fact that the current programming situation at the school shows that 30 non-academy students in the regular junior high program in grades 7, 8, 9 are combined into one class for physical education, health, academic core, enrichment, art, or computer technology, and do not have access to a multitude of opportunities typical of a junior high student is not ideal. Especially when the junior high academy students are engaged in their program of choice each afternoon, a combined 30 students from grades seven, eight, and nine are provided with limited opportunities for diverse course offerings because of their small numbers. I was genuinely concerned to hear that the low enrollment in junior high has created numerous staffing challenges and scheduling limitations, that these students were all combined into an afternoon class, and that these students, assuming there will be 30 students left um, in September, would be receiving the same experience next year. Program delivery such as this is something that is not optimal. It is something that should not be taken lightly and difficult to justify based on the hope that future enrollment may be different. As there is no guarantee that next year or even the year after that or the year after that, that there would be enough students in grades seven to nine to provide them with an optimal junior high educational programming experience, it is difficult to dispute the recommendation. 
when there is, I guess while there is consolation, and this was referenced to as well, that the enrollment may turn around in the future, something that we all welcome and recognizing that it is possible. I think Trustee Engel, you referenced this. Um, the lifespan of a community is a constant cycle of growth. That's been addressed time and time again. And if and when that happens, that commitment at that time can be justified. All we have to go by today is the current enrollment and future projections, and the projections at this time do not depict immediate growth, as difficult as it is. At this time, um, I will turn it back to Vice Chair Tuchansky to close your motion if you so choose, and will then be prepared to call the vote. Go ahead, Vice Chair Tuchansky. No, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't need to close my motion. Thank you. And at this time, I will um, proceed to call the vote, beginning with Trustee Harris. Go ahead, please. I believe you're on mute, Trustee Harris. Yeah, I'm okay. trying to get it off. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm in favor, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Trustee Harris. Trustee Engel. I'm in favor, Madam Chair. Thank you. Trustee Mutella. I'm in favor, Madam Chair. Thank you. Vice Chair Tuchansky. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, too, am in favor. Thank you. Trustee Tiber. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm in favor. Thank you. For the record, please note this motion is also carried, and we wish to once again um, express our sincere gratitude to each and every one of you, our, our, our parents, our Point guardians. Of Point of order. You have yes. to vote, Madam Chair. Oh, I have to vote. And I, yeah. of course, uh, am, am in favor. Thank you very much. Uh, it's not a good day for any of us. Um, and yes, I, I, I also support um, the recommendation. And therefore, for the record, please note this motion is also carried. And but you know at that at this time on behalf of the board of trustees once again our sincere gratitude our heartfelt thank you to each and every one of you for your valuable input and fit, feedback particularly uh, in such a, a significant decision such as this one thank you and so at this time uh, it now takes us to 2.2 Saint Basil Catholic Elementary Junior High School uh, school closure proposal uh, and I will turn it over to you Chief Ooh. Superintendent Martins. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, and trustees. And so, uh, for our second uh, second uh, item today, uh, again, I would call on Superintendent Fiaco and uh, uh, Christine Meadows, Manager of uh, Communications and Engagement, to to come forward. Thank you, Chief Superintendent Martin, Madam Chair, through the trustees. I will we'll go through the same process we did with Arlie Von Carmel. We'll start with uh, Christine Meadows. Thank you, John. First off, we want to thank everyone who contributed to the public participation process regarding the possible closure of St. Basil Catholic Elementary Junior High School. We know this feedback was essential for you, the Board of Trustees, in your decision making. In alignment with the Education Act and Policy 14 school closure, we have held multiple public meetings to provide the opportunity for the public to respond to the school closure proposal. Historically, in Edmonton Catholic schools, stakeholders have been given the opportunity to respond to the proposal at one single town hall style meeting. By offering a virtual information session coupled with our comprehensive and regularly updated website that includes answers to questions posed by stakeholders in a frequently asked questions document, followed by a series of six smaller virtual meetings we, that were all open for registration and public participation, we have provided an increased opportunity for the public to respond to the proposal. As a result of the realities of COVID-19 in January, the virtual format was such that members of the public could respond in a comfortable and safe setting where everyone who wanted to speak at the public meetings, not only those people who were comfortable speaking in front of a large audience, had the opportunity to do so. We prioritized inclusivity, equity and accessibility. Public participation opened on December 15th when an email went out to all ECSD families notifying them of an engagement opportunities to respond to the school closure proposal. It's also when we began accepting written, email, phone and video submissions and when our survey opened. Our public participation process was open to all stakeholders. We accepted feedback for nearly six weeks. Furthermore, 13 weeks have now passed since the notice of motion for the school closure proposal and today. That exceeds the requirement in policy 14 by one week. Here's an overview of the response we received. 
there were 460 completed surveys. We received 82 total emails from 70 unique senders, two written submissions that were received by mail. 158 members attended the live information session on January 17th, and to date, the recording of that information night that was posted to our website the following morning now has an additional 168 views on YouTube. During our six table talks, 76 people attended. In reviewing our attendance records, there were 65 unique participants. We received three video submissions and three phone calls providing feedback. In taking a closer look at the survey, the majority of the respondent, respondents who filled out a survey did not identify as parents or guardians of St. Basil or another ECSD school. The combination of the categories community member, other, a community or local business accounted for more than half of all survey respondents. These respondents identified themselves as former students, family members of current and former students, members of the Polish community, City of Edmonton residents, and seniors. 37% said they were parents of one or more students attending St. Basil, and 10% indicated they were parents at another ECSD school. It is important to note that of the stakeholder groups, the two groups that have the greatest stake that are closest to the decision are the parents and guardians of St. Basil and other ECSD students because educating their children is our core work. Respondents were asked to rate their level of support of or opposition to the proposed closure where one is strongly opposed and five is strongly supportive. About 76% said they were strongly or somewhat opposed. 21% said they were strongly or somewhat supportive and 3% said they were neutral. Of the 346 respondents who were strongly or somewhat opposed to the closure of St. Basil, 38% were parents and guardians of a student at St. Basil. 8% were parents and guardians at another ECSD school, and a combined 54% fell into the category of other, community or local business, and community member. Of the 98 respondents who were strongly or somewhat supportive of the closure of St. Basil, they were made up of the following groups. 33% identified as parents of St. Basil, 16% were parents or guardians of another ECSD school, and a combined 51% fell into the category of other, community or local business, and community members. Our table talks are where we reimagined our engagement strategy, hoping to give more stakeholders a chance to respond to the school closure proposal. Each table talk lasted one hour and was attended by two trustees, two members of our senior leadership, and either our chief superintendent or deputy superintendent. There were 76 total participants. In reviewing attendance records, seven people attended two table talks and two people attended three, resulting in 65 unique participants. During the 2019-2020 public participation involving St. Basil, we had 33 registered speakers at the engagement night. By having six small group options spread out over that time, we were able to hear from almost double that, a total of 65 unique participants. For stakeholders who were unable to attend a table talk session, we accepted emails, written and video submissions, and phone calls. Email was the most popular form of those feedback options. We received 82 emails from 70 unique senders. One of the things that we noticed when reviewing the survey is that some of the comments made in the surveys are textually identical to some of the emails. So it is reasonable for us to infer that people leveraged all digital means of responding to the proposal and therefore may have amplified the numbers in their opinion. In all, including the survey and table talks, we received a total of 626 submissions of feedback. That number includes individuals who shared their feedback on multiple occasions. I will now pass things to John Fiacco, Superintendent of Educational Planning, for more on what we heard. John. Thank you, Christine, for the synopsis of the feedback that has been collected since November 24th, 2021. As you are aware, there have been many comments and questions directed our way. Questions were raised regarding the timing of this closure process as it relates to the pandemic. The programming options and perceived kindergarten enrollment cap at St. Basil's. Developing alternate options like relocation, since the satisfaction of the program delivery is not an issue. Transportation costs 
and cancellations of routes. The financial information that was publicly posted as part of the division's recommendation to close St. Basil. Additional comments were made regarding a perceived lack of division support for the school, including that no effort was made to help the school with its viability challenges. Although most of the feedback did not support the proposed closure, the division did receive a considerable amount of feedback that supported the proposed closure of the school. Let's look at each of the common themes further. Throughout the engagement process, we received many questions as to why we're doing this now. These questions were based on the position that the trustees and the division made a promise that following the 2019-2020 relocation proposal, that the school would, would be given three years to improve its viability. And as such, we should not be considering this motion to close the school within this three-year window. In March of 2020, the division communicated that we would only commit to supplementing the marketing of St. Basil's on a yearly basis as budget cycles are done annually. The annual commitment is consistent with educational planning as school reviews are also done on a yearly basis. The school council requested that the division commit to a three-year marketing plan. This was the only mention of a three-year timeline was when the school council made this request. No specific timeline was indicated by ACSD in the communication delivered in March 2020. Additionally, feedback from repeat stakeholders in the engagement process acknowledged this fact. They stated in one of the many questions we received that even though a specific time was not given for program revitalization, a three-year marketing plan had been discussed. Another reoccurring theme that arose as we gathered feedback was the effects of the pandemic on the enrollment decline. We understand that COVID has been difficult and when making recommendations of this gravity, we analyze trends over an extended period of time. Student enrollment at St. Basil continues to decline and students continue to leave the program before they finish their grade nine year, making it difficult to offer a viable program. It is important to remember that the recommendation to consider the closure of St. Basil Catholic Elementary Junior High School is not rooted in COVID-19 factors, but rather the fact that the school met five out of the seven closure consideration factors. The enrollment issues at the school, the operational challenges existed before the pandemic started and continue to this day. Furthermore, from September 2017 to September 2019, Prior to the pandemic, 45 students left the Polish bilingual program at St. Basil. Comparing this loss in retention to the years of the pandemic from September 2019 to September 2021, 44 students left the program. These figures show a consistent pattern of the declining enrollment within the Polish bilingual program that has been in existence for many years, regardless of the pandemic. Trend analysis also shows that 50% of the students entering kindergarten will not complete grade nine in the Polish bilingual program. Other feedback received with respect to the pandemic affecting enrollment mentioned that the online school that was created was a contributor to the decline in enrollment. This fact was acknowledged at the information session as only six students are currently registered at the online school. These six students were given the opportunity to return to St. Basil, but chose to remain online. We were also questioned as to what bilingual language programs increased during the pandemic. And we discovered that despite COVID and the offering of an online school, 10 of our schools that offer language programs of choice saw their enrollment increase. Another common theme from the feedback received centered around the mental health and well-being of students that will potentially have to move schools. The pandemic has affected many students in ECSD and as such, the division has allocated a number of resources to support students' mental health. The event of a school closure, the division is committed to working with affected students and their families to support the positive transition to their community school. We are committed to providing an inclusive, welcoming, caring, respectful, 
safe and Catholic environment that promotes the well-being of all and fosters community support for all student mental health. Another concern was in response to the division's position that learning opportunities were not as diverse as they could be at St. Basil due to low enrollment. The feedback that was received challenged this position. The facts are that from our division assurance survey, we see that 73% of the grade four to six students are unsatisfied with their access to clubs and extracurriculars. Furthermore, the grade seven and nine program offerings do not have the same access to learning opportunities as their peers in other schools. At St. Basil School, there are only six options available and they need to be combined classes with elementary students in order to be offered. One of the foundational planning principles is to provide fair and equitable access to program choices for all students. We want to be able to ma maintain equitable access to school experiences in not only the mandated course subjects, but also the complementary options and associated activities that go along with these options, such as school clubs and extracurricular activities. During our data collection, there's a question regarding a perceived kindergarten enrollment cap and the contribution this may have had towards decreasing enrollment. We would like to address this question by stating, every student that wanted to register in kindergarten at St. Basil Catholic Elementary Junior High School for the 2021-2022 school year is currently registered at the school. No student wanting access to full day kindergarten in the Polish bilingual program was denied acceptance. I want to state again, at no point in time was a cap of 25 placed on the kindergarten enrollment. Historical registration numbers in kindergarten reflect this fact, as more than 25 students have been registered in kindergarten in the past. The issue we need to concern ourselves is with the retention of the kindergarten students. 50% of the students leave before they're reaching grade nine. As we mentioned in the information session, the 37 students accepted in 2016 for kindergarten is now a class of 20 grade five students, which represents a 46% drop in enrollment. Another commonly asked question that was asked is why the division did not consider a relocation of the Polish bilingual program rather than propose a school closure. In other words, why is the Polish program not given the same chance to relocate as was done with the JFLA program? The motion proposed to the Board of Trustees on November 24th, 2021 does not include a relocation. A relocation was proposed in 2020 and based on community feedback received in February of 2020, families did not have a desire to relocate this program to another school. It was made very clear that relocating the Polish program to any other school in the division would not be supported by the community and students would not attend. Is further supported by survey results that were presented on February 12th of 2020 to the board. The survey presented was conducted by the Polish bilingual parent community at St. Basil in 2019 20. The results indicated that 75% of the parents would not re enroll their child in a Polish bilingual program if we were to move to a different location. Firstly, when JFLA parents were asked for their feedback in October of 2020, they indicated a strong desire for additional leadership and extracurricular opportunities for their children. The location of the JFLA program was not a factor in their decision to enroll their children in the program. Feedback was also received asking for an explanation on why transportation costs were so high. ECSD has made busing a priority for St. Basil as we committed to supplemental funding to provide busing throughout the city a total of $417,909 of division funds were diverted to support transportation of the students for 2021-2022. Yellow bus routes are designed based on transportation applications received. The division creates routes to accommodate all eligible students. Regardless of the number of students requesting transportation, the division will transport eligible students to their school if an application is received. As a result, we currently have nine bus routes that are needed to serve the students throughout the city. 
And quite simply, the more buses required per school, the higher the cost to transport the students. In terms of trying to reduce the cost of transportation to the division, ECSD has diligently exhausted all options to reduce the number of routes to transport the Polish bilingual students effectively and efficiently. We also heard concerns that it was the cancellation of bus routes that created a loss of students at St. Basil. During the public participation process, many stakeholders indicated that 24 students left the Polish bilingual program due to a cancellation of route number 32 in the 2020-2021 school year. Route 32 was indeed canceled due to a lack of drivers. However, there are only seven students accessing this service at this time. Following the cancellation of Route 32, only one student left the Polish Bilingual program and decided to attend their designated community school. Common theme that arose from the feedback was a perception that the division did nothing to support the school's viability. Since March of 2020, the division has honored its commitment to support the program in multiple ways. To maintain enrollment numbers, bus service remained available citywide, and the division has continued to subsidize costs to the school over the last two budget cycles. It is important to note that the funds diverted to support the school are allocations over and above the basic grant dollars normally provided by the province. In addition to diverting division funds for the operation of this program for the 2020, 21 and 21, 22 school years, the division has developed a collaborative marketing strategy at the parents' request. We spent five times more on marketing than we normally would on a similar language program. As part of this strategy, the division undertook the following activities. On April 21, 2020, the division attended a virtual school council meeting to discuss the promotion of the Polish bilingual program. During the 2020-2021 registration cycle, the staff of the school delivered division-created handbills in every mailbox in the 2.4 kilometer walk area of the St. Beza community to promote registration. In June 2020, the division created a new Facebook page for the school as requested by the community. September 29th, 2020, the division met with the school to discuss current enrollment challenges and budget for the 2020-21 school year. On October 6, 2020, the division attended a Polish Bengal School Council to, to, to discuss current enrollment, budget challenges, and programming options for students. At this time, we introduced a survey tool to get the parents' feedback and focused on creating opportunities to get the word out as recruitment season was just around the corner. December 3rd of 2020, we had an internal meeting to review the marketing plan. On December 14th, 2020, the White Mud Bridge banner was created. December 15th, results of the October survey shared and plans to move JFLA announced to the stakeholders, thereby creating a stronger community presence in the entire facility for Polish bilingual programming. On January 15th of 2021, a request was made by the school to increase lease space. This request was granted. The school also requested and was granted the ability to promote and advertise the Polish program citywide. Swift messages were sent out by the division to all ECSD families advertising the program and the upcoming virtual open house. That was, and we did that on February 1st, February 7th, and February 15th of 2021. And then the virtual open house took place on February 16th. Other efforts made by the division involved lowering the net capacity of the school from 733 in 2018-19 to the current net capacity of 414. Despite this effort, utilization of St. Basil is 55% in 2020 and is projected at 50% for this school year. On May 6th, prior to our survey tool being sent out, Proposal was made to ECSD regarding developing a Hockey Canada Skills Program. The proposal included an application package, a fee structure, possible school calendar, a weekly schedule, and the results of a school survey sent to St. Basil Catholic Elementary Junior High School parents. Or interest from the community and the constraints of dealing with an external agency to provide educational service made this option 
not viable. And despite the strong and rigorous marketing plan and the efforts made by the parents and the division, St. Basil program has not increased their enrollment, nor are our projections favorable at this time. Financial situation at St. Basil School was another common theme that arose during our public participation process. More specifically, questions arose as to the deficit allocation wholly to the Polish bilingual program and the lack of any allocation to the deficit to the JFLA program. Similar to the approach at other schools with multiple programs, allocations and costs for two programs at St. Basil were not split due to complexities associated with attributing specific allocations and costs to each of the programs. The financial transfer to support operations as well as transportation to St. Basil School were presented in the school closure proposal as well as in the information session on January 17th of 2022. In both instances, we reported the metrics with respect to operating the school, not the specific Polish bilingual program that operated within the school conjunction with the JFLA program through to the end of 2020-2021. Feedback from the engagement suggested the financials should have been separated to show a clear representation of the transfers solely related to the Polish bilingual program. I would like to ask CFO Grattan to provide additional information that addresses this concern. Thank you, Superintendent Fiaco, and good afternoon, Chair Palazzo, Trustees, and Chief Superintendent Martin. As you are aware, I had the pleasure of attending the information sessions on St. Basil, as well as all table talk, table talk discussions. As Superintendent uh, Fiaco just shared, concerns were expressed during the engagement session, the impact of the JFLA Academy on transfers to St. Basil was not included in the financial analysis. Before I speak to the graph before you and the five-year cumulative transfer or diversion of funds trend to St. Basil and the Polish bilingual program, it is important that I share two important points with respect to these concerns. Number one, the division and our principals manage our school and track costs within these schools on the overall financials of the school, not the cost of individual programs running within the school. For example, in the case of St. Basil, we did not track how much time administration, learning coaches or other support staff spent, spent on the Polish bilingual or JFL programs, or what portion of supplies equipment, or other consumables were spent on their respective programs. We simply do not track or have this granular level of information. That said, the concerns expressed during the engagement process were <coughs> reasonable. Let me repeat that. The, the concerns expressed during the engagement were reasonable. So given the feedback administration, actually given the feedback received during the engagement sessions, administration needed to come up with a reasonable way of allocating the funds being transferred to St. Basil between the Polish bilingual and JFLA programs. As I just mentioned, while we do not track individual costs or details, we do know the historical Polish bilingual and JFLA programs enrollments in the school. Relative enrollment of the two programs is a reasonable way to allocate cumulative transfers by the division to the school. So with this approach in place, we calculated the St. Basil enrollment to be 73% Polish program and 27% JFLA, JFLA program over the five-year period through to August 31st, 2021. As noted in the graph that's before you right now, this ratio results in a cumulative transfer to the Polish bilingual program 
of $3.9 million. That's the orange line you see. As compared to a cumulative transfer to St. Basil, the blue line of over $5 million. The reasonableness of this approach is supported by what we see with the trend line, trend line going forward into the 21-22 forecast. Namely, it stays on trend, even though the Polish program is the only remaining program in 21-22 after the move of the JFLA program to St. Cecilia. My last point with respect to this slide is to remind uh, is to remind you that 21-22 is a forecast. During the engagement process, concerns were expressed that the enrollment numbers in 21-22 were changing. This is a correct observation, as administration was pulling modestly different forecast data from different periods between the original report and FOIP requests we received in December. Please note, this graph uses the lowest transfer numbers or most, most conservative numbers we have on the record for 21-22, but it remains an open question as to whether the actual transfers will be 20 or 30 or $40,000 higher once the year is complete and actuals are known. Regardless, of the regardless if the actual tr transfers are a little higher or a little lower than forecast, it is important to note the trend line is not going to change much. So what is the key takeaway from this graph? Simply put, there have and there continues to be significant transfers to the Polish bilingual program that would otherwise be available to all other students in the division. Next slide, please. So the last slide showed you the cumulative transfers and the trend line for St. Basil, the school as a whole, as well as the Polish bilingual program. This slide shows you the annual transfer and the trend line for the Polish bilingual program. As you can see, the four year average annual transfer to the Polish bilingual program, 2018 through to 2122, is approximately $574,000, and it has been relatively flat over that time period. Please note, I excluded the larger transfer in 2017-18 from the average, as I believe it's an outlier due to it reflecting a catch-up from prior years. So what is the key point with respect to this graph? Simply, a past as well as ongoing consistency in the transfer or diversion of funds to the Polish bilingual program, even after the JFLA program moved to St. Cecilia in 21-22. Back to you, Superintendent Viaco. Oh, you're on mute. My apologies. Part of policy 14 school closure involves the opportunity for the city of Edmonton to provide feedback on the impacts of the school closure to the community. The city of Edmonton submitted a community impact statement on January 17, 2022, identifying two significant community impacts. These are the same concerns identified on January 20th of 2020. They are community access to gymnasium bookings under the joint use agreement and St. Basil's a hub and gathering place for the Polish community. As a result of the potential impacts, the city of Edmonton is pleased with ECSD's commitment to continue to allow gymnasium space for community access under the joint use agreement and to continue to rent space to the Polish culture group to foster a gathering hub for the Polish community. Madam Chair, through the Board of Trustees, on November 24, 2021, the board reviewed the St. Basil Catholic Elementary Junior High School closure proposal and based on the information contained within, voted in favor of providing notice to the community of the proposed closure on February 23rd, 2022. 
Since that time, a community engagement process has been undertaken. And over the past 13 weeks, the division undertook the most comprehensive and inclusive engagement process to date and heard a plethora of comments, suggestions, and questions. After two years of working with the community, the poor retention rates and low enrollments continue to cause the financial strains, not only on the school, but on the division as a whole. This recommendation is rooted in the principles of equitable use of division resources for all of our 43,230 division students. St. Basil School offers a program of choice. It is important that programs of choice be financially viable so as not to negatively impact the resources available to all division students. In addition to achieving increased efficiencies and equitable use of division funds for all students, other clear benefits to the students of St. Basil include having more convenient access to the local school community, thereby spending less time on the bus and more time in school participating in school activities and clubs. Having increased access to complementary courses and extracurriculars, which would also increase the engagement level of all students. After reviewing the feedback obtained during the engagement process, our recommendation contained in the school closure proposal remains the same. And I'll pass it to Chief Superintendent Martin. Thank you very much, Superintendent Fiacco, Madam Chair, Trustees. Again, uh, it is never our intention to close a school. We need the help of families and the community to ensure that it becomes a viable place of learning. I am tasked with ensuring that we have a wonderful, sustainable Catholic school division for all of our students. We need to ensure that every one of our schools is getting what they need to ensure optimal learning for all kids. I would also like to thank the administration at St. Basil and the staff at St. Basil because they have been working very hard. It's a top quality school of learning. It truly is. They, they have been uh, working under, under the strain of, uh, of the proposal and we recognize that, we truly do. Having said that, we are bringing this forward to, to the board because we feel that this, this is the best option for our, our kids and for the division as a whole. And so, uh, Madam Chair, Board of Trustees, uh, I bring you forward the recommendation that the board approves the closure of St. Basil Catholic Elementary Junior High School, effective June 30th, 2022. Uh, thank you very much, Chief Superintendent Martin, Superintendent Fiaco, and once again, Manager of Communications and Engagement Services, Christine Meadows, and your respective teams. Uh, Chief Superintendent Martin, thank you for applauding the staff and administration of the school. Um, that, that is uh, truly appreciated by this board. As this is a motion, uh, and I do see Vice Chair Truchansky in queue, I will turn it to you to make that motion, Vice Chair Truchansky. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to move that the Board of Trustees approves the closure of St. Basil Catholic Elementary Junior High School, effective June 30th, 2022. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Truchansky. Do you wish to speak to your motion? Thank you, Madam Chair, I do. Go ahead, please. Thank you. The Polish program at St. Basil has a rich history with Edmonton Catholic schools and is with a great deal of thought, reading and reflection that I make this motion. Times, families and demographics are changing. What was once a rich and sought after flourishing program has slowly declined as families are no longer looking for this program of choice within Edmonton Catholic schools. I was moved the last time we met with the families and the community partners in March, 2020. I couldn't believe the number of enthusiastic emails, detailed letters, and positive comments from everyone 
indicating how invested they all were in the Polish program and how critical it was to the community. So critical, in fact, that everyone spoke of how necessary it was to keep it in its exact location, so close to the parish and other centers of influence in the community. I remember leaving that gymnasium where it felt like there was barely any room to move, thinking to myself, wow, I have never seen so many people from in and out of the community so passionate about a program. I was relieved when the decision was made to no longer bring forward the recommendation for closure. I believed in it and the community. We listened and heard families tell us that they were surprised a proposal like this was being brought forward. In spite of all the facts and figures showing a program that was clearly in trouble, the division and the community decided to delay the proposal for a closure and work together to breathe new life into this school. I could hardly wait to see where we would land with the renewed vigor and commitment to finding new students. I was grateful to see the various strategies that the division put forward to increase the enrollment in St. Basil's School. I was constantly driving by signs and banners, and in fact, I believe I drove under the banner on the White Mud Freeway about a thousand times. But despite the efforts of the school, parents, and the division, this program of choice continues to decline in enrollment and the projection for the future remains the same. We are no longer able to financially support a program in the manner it requires without severely impacting other students around our division. I know that this will disappoint many families and the community members, but I believe that this is the right decision at the right time. There are simply not enough families looking for this program of choice. I'd like to thank Chief Superintendent Martin Superintendent Fiaco and his team for their effort over the last two years to try and make this a viable program for the future. Not many people will know how much time and effort were invested in this, but I do, and I'm grateful. It will never feel like we did enough, but I assure you, we did. I also wanted to thank our senior leadership team for the time they spent in the table talk sessions that were held in January. To take so much time out of already full days shows your commitment to doing what is right for our division, regardless of the impact it had on you. But my deepest gratitude remains with Superintendent Fiaco. The amount of time and effort you put into this is incomprehensible. You were tasked with an impossible job and you were thorough and professional at every turn. You showed up at every session, reiterating the facts and the reasons over and over again. You discuss data, areas of concern, cost and impacts to the community. Not once did you ever show a lack of empathy or a lack of understanding for the effect that this would have on the families and the community around them. Knowing how this has consumed you for the past few years, I was appalled at the comments that were directed at you in many of the emails we received and the statements that were made during the table talk sessions. The vitriol, the horrendous remarks, the attacks and the insinuations were shocking and it bothered me each time I read the documents. It felt personal this time around and less about the school and the community. Knowing however that emotions were involved and high, I looked past it, but it was such a departure from the previous engagement, it caught me off guard. And despite this, and due to the reasons outlined by the division in the school closure proposal, I will be supporting the closure of St. Basil Elementary Junior High School. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair Chachansky, for your most compelling and impactful words and, and for applauding the work of our administration. Um, that was uh, quite moving. Thank you so much. I do see Trustee Harrison Q. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and like my colleague, I do want to express my uh, deepest appreciation to uh, Superintendent Fiaco and his team uh, for the uh, for the extremely diligent work, very professionally done, um, and um, like my colleague as well, uh, I regret to have seen some of the uh, commentary that came. Um, that was disturbing and uh, inappropriate, I think. Uh, although I do understand that uh, 
uh, when emotions are involved, people will, uh, you know, sometimes say things that they would uh, prefer not to in a, you know, calmer time. Um, there's a lot about what you have shared here, Superintendent Fiaco and, and Chief Superintendent Martin and your teams that I find very compelling. Um, certainly, um, the Polish program is a program of choice. And as a program of choice, it should be self-sustaining. I do, I do firmly believe that. Um, I do see the financial case, uh, and the financial case is very strong. Um, programs uh, such as this should not, on an ongoing basis, be uh, cross-subsidized. Um, that is, that is, that is a simple fact. Um, enrollment is currently at a currently at an unsustainable level. And uh, you've drawn some conclusions based on your your data that the uh, that the trend is down. Um, it looks looked to me as if it had hopefully kind of in this last year settled a bit, and that uh, creates a bit of a question for me. Certainly, the busing is a huge issue for this in terms and adds in, in substantial costs, and it it actually potentially uh, puts the uh, program in a bit of a hole right from right from the get go. Uh, because of those additional costs. That being said, the program is uh, it is an extremely good program. This is a phenomenally good program, and uh, and and uh, I think that families have been well served by it. So I do un absolutely understand their uh, their commitment to it. That said, um, all of that said, uh, I still am extremely troubled with the timing. Of the of the proposal, I did say when we initially uh, this was initially introduced that um, if this had come forward as a as an update, uh, giving us a heads up, giving the community a heads up, I would have been very much in in favor of of hearing that and 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 you know doubling down on our efforts with the community to get things turned around, but it didn't. So the timing the timing of this comes as a serious concern for me. And I do realize, uh, and I have been corrected on this, uh, that uh, I had certainly, from my own perspective, assumed that we were providing this uh, community with a, you know, a, a, a kind of a window, uh, a little bit of runway to uh, get things turned around. I do realize that that uh, commitment, that formal commitment, was was not made, was never made. Uh, I do regret that, uh, and I do regret, in fact. As you recall, we didn't actually have the uh, board meeting that where we would have spoken on this matter and 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 had a, a vote on this matter back in 2020 in March 17th of 2020. We we didn't have we didn't have that board meeting because it got canceled because of COVID. So as everything was shutting down, so we didn't have an opportunity to come forward at that time and share our uh, our our narrative around what those expectations might be. Um, I do have a, a concern as well with timing in, in that, uh, given the circumstances, I, I do not think the, uh, the, uh, the time frame that has been provided, given the circumstances of COVID, and I do understand that you've mentioned that COVID hasn't caused any, it, it's not the reason for the enrollment decline, but one can absolutely understand that COVID could have impacted the community's ability to uh, to get out and 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 make the case uh, that it did impact. I believe, no question, uh, that it would have impacted the uh, the community's ability to 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 actually get out and, and market this program, recruit for this program, that kind of thing, because people weren't being allowed in the school, you know. So, uh, so I think that that is a, that's a serious issue for me. Um, I do also have concerns about there not being um, a uh, another option that is being provided. There's no option here for a move, and I, to a certain extent, I'm 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 thinking that that when the community communicated back through its survey results in February of 2020 that it had it was not interested in moving uh, to another facility. I don't think the community at that time had any sense that its um, that its uh, that its responses 
would be looked at two years later as in some way, shape or form a justification that the, uh, the program would be, would be closed down. And I've gone back into the, uh, into the detail on those, on those survey results back into February of 2020, looked over, over that, those responses and have seen that there were in fact a variety of reasons why people uh, voted against it. It wasn't just that it was, yes, there were people who were locked on to St. Basil. It had to be St. Basil or nothing. But there were many, many, many people who said it needs to be a central location. And where you have proposed it to go, Northwest Edmonton, it is not, there's no, no, no close connection to the Polish community there at all. Why Northwest Edmonton? And the other element, or the other theme that I drew out of looking back on those survey results of of 2020, uh, February 2020, was uh, a family saying, I don't like it because you're separating the kids as well. You know, you're separating the elementary from the junior high. So I don't like the fact that you're moving it and you're moving it to, uh, you know, one elementary and one junior high. So I think that in my sense, there was a variety of reasons when I look go back and look at that data uh, as to why the community did not like and did, did said that they wouldn't be prepared to do that move at that time. And, uh, and so um, what comes to mind, and I certainly have seen from the community's responses uh, to this engagement, that many folks have indicated that they would be amenable to this being a uh, uh, if 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 this were moved into some other central location, the main thing for them is 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 to secure the program. Is that the program have an opportunity to continue, and whether that preferably at St. Basil, but if not St. Basil, then somewhere else in proximity to the uh, to the core to to where the the Polish community is. And we do have elementary, junior high schools in that area that appear to have you know, at least at first blush, uh, you know, capacity to to absorb that. So I wonder if you could respond to that last aspect uh, of, you know, that uh, what I'm reading with respect to those uh, survey results that the community might actually uh, be more amenable to, uh, to uh, ha- uh, moving that program somewhere adjacent to the, to the Polish core if it meant the survival of the program. I wonder if you could comment on that and and what would be the potential for doing something like that if we were to do that? Consider that. Madam Chair, through you, sorry. No, go ahead. I was gonna call upon you. Thank you very much, okay. Superintendent Fiacco. My apologies. Madam Chair, through you, Trustee Harris. Um, the motion that was brought forth in November was not for a location that made that perfectly clear. Uh, that recommendation back in November is based on, you're correct, on the feedback received from the community. Uh, a very strong feedback uh, that the location of the school was very important. Follow up to that survey was done in October of 2020 as well when we asked the parents of the community, why did, or did you choose the Polish bilingual program at St. Basil? And again, it came in high ranking in October of 2020 that the location of the school is of utmost importance. Conversely, when we asked the JFLA parents in that same survey, when we asked their community, that came ranked lowest, 5%. As a matter of fact, JFLA parents, they did not care where the where the program was. So that's why we moved that program to St. Celia and kept the Polish program where it was. So my understanding is we're at, we're at the stage right now where we are uh, going to decide Board is going to decide on the motion that was presented in November. Hmm. So I, I understand that, um, uh, and the uh, I guess I guess the question is: you have interpreted that uh, that is only Saint Basil that that community would accept, and what I'm saying from uh, from you know my review of the, that data is. That yes, that was a theme, but another theme was around um, a central location, something proximal to uh, to the Polish community. So that hasn't been addressed, and I do understand the uh, uh, what the what the what the motion currently is. 
And so thank you very much, uh, Trustee Harris. So the motion is as uh, as presented. Uh, I believe that our administration has addressed the questions that you have posed. I'm not certain if you have any other further clarity uh, and otherwise I will move forward. Uh, uh, I'll come in around in second, in second cut, okay? Thank you so much. Uh, Trustee Tiber, go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so first of all, I echo um, my, my Trustee Trachansky's comments in the beginning. Um, it, it's hard. It's never easy. Um, we, we've gone through this process once before and it's now back uh, in front of us. And again, it's something that we don't take lightly. Um, the, the emails, again, the calls, the, the, the data, the, the table talks, conversations, all of it. Uh, Trustee Tiber, I believe you're frozen again. I will put myself back on. Oh, are you back on? Okay. Where did I land off? Why is this happening? Okay. Once um, I'm good. Go ahead. You're good. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I found um, quite interesting about this process, and I would really like to comment on it, is the amount of um, opportunity our community had to participate. Unlike before, where it was usually one night uh, in a gym with uh, a lot of parents and community members expressing their concerns or their their support, um, this gave us an opportunity to hear from many different people, many different times, in many different um, situations. So for that, I thought it was a very well done process. And I wanna thank you for all of the time and all of the effort it took to put that together. Um, you know, as a program of choice, I am really concerned about the cost of this program. I am. There have been many reasons and, and heartfelt reasons that we've heard in this process to to support or, or to to uh, not support this this motion. Um, and we've heard that, you know, we have a certain amount of funds that are used in the best interest of all our students in the division. And that is something as a trustee we are tasked to make sure that we do carry out our fiduciary responsibility. And I am concerned that hundreds of thousands of dollars are divided from other Edmonton Catholic sites in to, to sustain this program of choice. That, that has a huge concern for me. And the timing, it's never good. It's never a good time to, to close a school, whether it's COVID or not COVID. But one of the things that we have to do is to make sure, and the, the time is never good, but all of education in Alberta has continued. And schools across the division, across the province have continued to educate our children. And I think that is not something that we, we in my opinion, um, is going to be a deciding factor for me today because we are looking at many more factors than that one um, at one point. But I want to say I love the passion of this community and the concern that this school has has shown not once but twice. I mean the the passion and the of the entire language and culture of the program it's just something that I I know will continue strong into Edmonton. I know there will be a, a many ways, many different ways that our our the Polish culture and language will be shared with our students. And I've seen that and I'm quite confident from what I've seen and what I've heard from so many community members, so many parents um, from not only Edmonton, but beyond Edmonton, which is, is quite commendable. So for that, I thank you. And I thank you for, you know, really having the desire to express um, your culture and it's something that our, our students and, and the young children of Edmonton will definitely go forward with. And I thank you for that. I do support the motion to uh, close the St. Basil program or St. Basil School. Regrettably, with a heavy heart, I do support it. And I do hope that again, that our students will continue with Catholic education. Our students will continue in in Edmonton and continue to go and enjoy Edmonton Catholic schools and really enjoy your time there. 
So thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Trustee Tiber. Uh, just going back to Trustee Harris. Trustee Harris, I never had an opportunity. First of all, let me just finish with Trustee Tiber. Trustee Tiber, thank you again for your compelling words as well, and for sharing uh, where you where you stand uh, in regards to this the supporting of this motion. Trustee Harris, I wanted to publicly acknowledge. I wanted to uh, say thank you to you uh, for publicly acknowledging uh, uh, some references that you had made previously, and you made reference to that. Thank you very much. That being said, I just want to remind trustees that we are dealing with the motion at hand and so that is the motion that we are speaking to today uh, and so while some of you may have um, uh, may be looking for clarity other than the motion um, I'm just uh, addressing that this would be a point of order so uh, I will continue with that being said and turn it to trustee Mutala who is in queue go ahead please thank you madam chair and and also I first of all want to echo what trustee Chichansi and Taber have said in regarding to this program, okay? Thank you to Chief Superintendent Mark Martin, Superintendent Fiaco, Communication Manager Christine Meadows, and also to Chief Superintendent James Gratton today to clarify those, the graphs for us, okay? Because you before said that we couldn't divide it up and then we were, like it wasn't divided up to show the JFL program or the Polish program. But today you made it very clear that 73% of that was the Polish program and 27% was the JFL program, okay? So I wanna thank everybody for participating in the engagement process and for all the reports and documentation and emails regarding this program, the Polish bilingual program, language of choice. No one ever wants to close this program and no one wants to, uh, but, I'm emotional about this because this is an important decision. Since 2019, despite all the efforts of Edmonton Catholic Schools and the Polish community, there has been no significant increase in student enrollment in order to make this program viable. We only get $6,000 plus dollars from the Alberta government to educate each student, and some of that money has to go with the admin costs, okay? So when you look at what has happened, that from 2000 eight to 2021, there's been a decline of nearly 100 students. So the utilization rate for St. Basil's is at 55%. It meets five of the seven factors for school closure. With 210 K-9 students, we can't balance the budget for this program of choice. And, and Edmonton Catholic Schools has been subsidizing this program for six years, plus the transportation costs. The four year annual transfer to the Polish bilingual language of choice has been approximately $574,000. And over the past years, it's been up to $3.9 million. St. Basil's would need at least four to 500 students to cover and balance the budget for this program. So I, I, am, I am trying to be fiscally responsible schools in this division and I know over the years the, the since 2020 I never said we were going to give the Polish bilingual program three years to turn this enrollment around so I understand when superintendent Fiaco explained it that it came from the parent council to the marketing program so that's that was good to have that all in place and we didn't put a cap on the kindergarten I know that for a fact as well the parents are the first educators of their children, and they instill the culture, faith, language, and traditions to their children. The church and school are there to enhance the parents' efforts. So you will never lose your Polish culture. I grew up in Saskatchewan. I'm Ukrainian. I never had Ukrainian school. I instilled faith and culture and traditions to me and I have them to this day. So you will, you the Polish culture, the Ukrainian culture, they're all a very strong culture and the family will help and the community and the church will help keep this culture in place. Uh, thank you, Trustee. I just wanna say, yes, I'm in support of the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Mutala. I'm echoing, am I echoing on your end? No. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I do see, uh, thank you for your uh, compelling words as well and for sharing your um, um, 
some of the uh, heartfelt sentiments that you wanted to share regarding the school. I do see Trustee Engel in queue. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I want to start out by thanking the parent community and the students for engaging in the process not once but twice. I want to thank them for the diligence that they showed. Um, I, I cannot believe the time and effort that was put into uh, saving the school, um, how important the school and the Polish program was. I went back in time again um, to a time many years ago when it was a vibrant program and we had the Polish community um, throw celebrations and invite the trustees. I even remember uh, my next door neighbor who was Polish with three children that spoke Polish, teaching me Polish to bring greetings as I was chair of the board at the time. And so all of that pride, I, it makes me jealous because I, I, I think I'm a mixture of everything European and I don't even really have a culture program. But to when we had the um, 2020 gymnasium presentation and to listen to people speak and sing, it, it's a beautiful thing. And, and I really want to, I want to thank you for carrying it on for your kids. It, 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 it gives, it gives them a reason. And I, I think um, oftentimes when we look at the Aboriginal community and some of the, the horrible history, a lot of it is, is they didn't feel that they belonged and the Polish community is quite, quite close knit and they, the children have that. So it, it's a very hard decision to close the program. Um, I also want to thank Superintendent, Chief Superintendent Martin and his team, the resources that went into this. I'd like to uh, thank uh, CFO Grattan because he was very good with answering the questions about the money. I uh, Every time we got a letter, I would be more confused on how JFL entered this. And the transportation seems to be the top off of where um, a lot of the money goes. And adding more bus routes if we are trying to attract kids from more areas of the city, would just uh, exasperate this problem if we couldn't get the good numbers. I, I really want to turn my attention to uh, Superintendent Fiaco. Again, I mentioned earlier in the meeting that Superintendent Fiaco is tasked with this job. The division has to run smoothly. He, this is his job, is to point out to the Chief Superintendent and then to the Board of Trustees the most efficient way to give the best education possible to all 43,000 plus students within Edmonton Catholic. And um, it hurt me deeply to see some of the comments that were directed at him. And I, I agree that in emotion we say things we would not normally say, but I do want uh, Superintendent Fiaco to know that it did not go unnoticed that he attended every single meeting and with due diligence answered every single question and never lost his grace or composure. So I, I really want to thank him for that. Um, I much like uh, Trustee Harris, feel I wish we ha had more time, but can we continue to lose $554,000 a year or 574? Um, like Trustee Harris, my first go-to place uh, last time this school came up for closure was let's move it. Um, I got a very strong sense from absolutely everyone I communicated with. It wasn't an option. Um, I went into it and I believed in the end of the day when the decision was made, I believed that it was either keep it there or there would be no Polish program at all. Um, that is the only reason I'm not moving an amendment to, uh, to see if there's a, an alternative to keep it somewhere where it could be more viable financially. Because I clearly believe that door was shut uh, tight uh, around two, um, two years ago. But I do appreciate Trustee Harris bringing it up. And I do appreciate the, the points he's, he has made as well. Having said that, I guess the other thing that, that I really want to look at is that Edmonton Catholic Schools can't continue to offer programs at a loss to in, in any area. Like we love all of our, our Ukrainian bilingual programs, our French bilingual programs, Spanish. But when we come at, when there comes a time when we can't offer them and finance them and the rest of the division is suffering, 
we have to make these tough decisions. And I'm, I'm sure that Superintendent Fiacco, he does not want to come and take your program away. He wants to make programs that are sustainable for all the children in the district. St. Basil's has always offered a quality education. And I'm sure if this motion didn't pass like it did not go through uh, two years ago, the division would continue to offer that quality education. Uh, it was just absolutely wonderful to see the student at St. Basil get 100% again on the computer test. Uh, made by the uh, University of Alberta. Like the, the education, the academic education and the culture education that was given at that school would was second to none. And that's why it's costing us so much money. I truly believe that. I truly believe that if we decided to water it down, only put the teachers in there we had money for, um, have the longer routes, all the things that we could do to water it, we don't do that. We give it our all. The academic excellence is there. The transportation is as good as it gets. And that that's that's who we are at Edmonton Catholic Schools. But once the cost overruns, we have to make a decision. Because I'm not about watering down quality. And that's what makes me so proud to be a trustee with Edmonton Catholic Schools and serve with our current administration. They won't water down quality. They told us two years ago, this is costing this, 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 and this. And we'll try and turn the ship around. But they never once said, you're on your own, we're leaving you, the quality's gone. The quality kept up. And it would again if the board made that decision. Um, so I guess the point I'm making is we don't offer something half halfway. We offer it with our whole heart and soul. And in this particular case, we can no longer do that in looking at what it's costing the division as a whole. So for that reason, and that reason only, I uh, will be supporting the motion as presented by my colleague, Trustee Truchansky. Thank you very, Thank much. very much. Thank you very much, Trustee Engel. I'm sorry, I hear myself echoing. Maybe it's not on your end, but I hear it on my end. Thank you very much uh, for sharing your perspective as well. Um, your words are greatly appreciated. So every trustee has had an opportunity to speak. I will go into round two before inserting myself, and I do see Trustee Harris in queue. Go ahead, please. Oh, thanks so much, Madam Chair and and uh, colleagues. Uh, you know, I very much respect and appreciate your uh, perspectives on this. Reasonable people will differ. Uh, and um, I, I think... And again, I, I very much appreciate what our administration has done in the, in the, and both school-based as well as uh, central and our community for the stress that this has put everyone under and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the commitment that you've made to trying to get this decision right. I absolutely respect and appreciate that. I, I, I constantly come back to, you know, the tagline that we use for taking a look at, at so much of what we do here in, in relation to these closures and consolidations, and that is walking together. Walking together. And I think that this is particularly the case where we're considering a proposal for St. Basil, where that community is one of the most committed faith community, Catholic faith communities that we have in the division. And we all know that the division is very blessed to welcome and support students of all denominations, providing a safe and caring and welcoming learning environment for all. And that our learning environments are enriched by our diversity. A large number, uh, we have a large number, very significant per percentage of students who are of other denominations. One, that's absolutely wonderful. And at the same time, we cherish the commitment of our faith community, our Catholic families. They are our foundation. They are the foundation of what built this house, and uh, they are a reason for being. And the community supporting St. Basil and this program is one of these very devout, very strong communities with virtually all students raised in our faith traditions. It's very important for, uh, and I think it is very important for our foundational faith communities to know that we value them, we want to walk with them. And certainly a concern has been raised and very strongly from this faith community where many feel that we're not only not walking with them, but we're walking away from them. And truth be told, in some cases, I think some folks might have a perspective that we're running away from them because the way this is currently structured, the door 
could be close to a program that they cherish greatly, a one of a one of a kind program, unlike any of our other language programs in our division where families can go to another location. There is nowhere else to go for this Polish education. And once it's gone, it is gone and it is gone forever. So, you know, the community, this predominantly Catholic community has been very clear that, that you know, they, they, they want to love us uh, and they, and, and, you know, and it, they want to stay connected. Uh, and, and so, you know, a proposal that comes forward to close a program like this, a one of a kind program when in, a, in an environment you know, over the course of the last couple of years, two thirds, you know, of the schools within the division have experienced some, some enrollment drops. And when, you know, when that's happening less than two years after the board said it would work with the community through administration to help stabilize the program, I, you know, I think that there's, there's gonna be some challenges there. And, and so I, I really think that, uh, that um, you know, there's, there's some challenges if, you know, we, we, we move forward with a closure without somehow seriously considering a move of this program to another centrally located um, uh, school that would, uh, and I think if we if we didn't seriously consider that, that would be a, a self-inflicted wound. And if, uh, if uh, I, I would be prepared to, uh, to uh, make a motion to amend, um, if that would be in order to do, uh, and it Which would be- order, Madam Chair? Yep. Could you uh, please get General Counsel to weigh in on this? Oh, thank you very much. Trustee Harris, are you, uh, thank you. So tr Trustee Turchansky, uh, sorry, Vice Chair Turchansky, my, my apologies, is asking for a point of order. If you are suggesting that an amendment that you're, are you suggesting that we amend the current motion? Is that what we're hearing here? Yes. Okay, is. thank you. Thank you. And so Vice Chair Tuchansky has called a point of order. And so I would like to advise uh, and asking for our parliamentari parliamentarian to please provide us with advice. And so I do see uh, General Counsel Carbonic uh, in queue. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just from the statements uh, preceding uh, Trustee Harris's uh, request uh, to amend and, and uh, uh, making an assumption that uh, that the the amendment would uh, strike the a word close and uh, potentially uh, replace with the uh, the word relocate the program. Um, the uh, as you all know, uh, in terms of your procedure, uh, we first look to your board policies, uh, and when board policies don't cover a particular process, we look to Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, for our direction. Um, Robert's Rules of Orders is very clear uh, that amendments are uh, made to uh, clarify uh, or add additional detail to motions. Uh, where a motion is amended, uh, so the effect of that amendment would be to defeat the main motion, uh, they're out of order. In this instance, your, your main motion is to close uh, the effect of a relocation, I think, is uh, fairly clear that the program would remain, uh, wouldn't be closed. Uh, so I think it's fairly clear that that amendment is out of order uh, in the sense that it uh, basically defeats the main motion. So that would be my advice. Uh, if, if more details required, that's sort of the, uh, the, um, the essence of it all. But uh, if anybody has any additional questions, I'm happy to clarify. I do have a question on that. Okay, so before you ask, uh, Trustee Harris, uh, so thank you, General Counsel Carbonic. Based on this, I am of the position that the that the uh, proposed amendment is out of order. I but I haven't made the amendment yet. Um, well, the, the suggested. So go ahead, Trustee Harris, make your amendment, and then we will move forward from there. So, uh, and this harkens back, I guess, to what I was speaking about before, where... Um, I guess right at the at the outset, where the uh, division in past, when it put forward proposals to close a program, uh, also had a comment on the end of that. Okay, uh, and the comment, on, and so that's what I'm thinking here is is this would not necessarily 
be structured in that manner that you've suggested, uh, General Counsel, but actually would be structured to, uh, since I can hear where 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 this is going, uh, to uh, sort of accept that uh, and then add on uh, to it at the tail end. So, for example, something to the effect of, uh, and it would be well, with all due respect, Trustee Harris, yeah. could you state rather than in speaking in abstracts at this point in time, can you state your motion to amend? Yes, I can. That's what I was uh, just about to do. Um, the Board of Trustees approves the closure of St. Basil Elementary Junior uh, High School. And I've said here effective June 30th, 2023 and the relocation of the Polish program for both elementary and junior high schools to another centrally located elementary junior high community school or other centrally located community schools for the 2023-24 school year. That structure is consistent with the structure that we've used before in these, uh, in these closures. Uh, Madam Chair, through to the Board of Trustees, again, I would, because of the the notion of the relocation of the program, um, it, it I believe this, that's problematic uh, in terms of an amendment. Uh, the at St. Basil's currently there is only one program, which no. is the no. whole. Yes, sir, there is. Uh, the Gen if you're referring to Genesis, Genesis is a separate program with a separate school code. So when we speak of St. Basil's, um, all we're talking about uh, in terms of uh, division process is the Polish bilingual program. I don't think it's ever been contemplated uh, from November onwards. Uh, either through the consultation process or by administration that the closure of St. Basil Catholic Elementary Junior High School, sorry, Catholic, yes, Elementary Junior High School, at all contemplates the closure of Genesis. And that's because Genesis has a separate school code. So this motion, as it sits before the board today, contemplates the closure of St. Basil's, which by inference, because of the only program being there at this point in time, means the closure of the Polish bilingual program. Furthermore, uh, for those trustees who have, uh, who have been part of school closures in the past, you all know that we close the school. We don't go into detail that we're also closing the kindergarten program, the K-6 to program, the junior high program, unless that's the intent of the motion. Um, so to, to infer that there has to be some additional comment to this motion that speaks to the closure of the programming is not consistent with our past process uh, and furthermore isn't consistent with any process that I know of uh, in other school jurisdictions in the province. Um, uh, otherwise, the you know the, you could get an absurdity in this that you close the school and the programs may remain. That that's that's a, a bit of, a, of an absurdity. The, the amendment itself, uh, again, since it talks about the relocation of the program, uh, I still am of the position that it's out of order because it is contrary. Uh, it, 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 it goes to the survival of the program, uh, whereas the main motion before you is to close. So to pass the motion as amended would be to defeat the motion, uh, the main motion, and so, according to Robert's Rules of Order, it'd be my position that that's out of order. Thank you very much, uh, General Counsel Carbonic. And so, at this time, uh, I accept Vice Chair Turchansky's um, uh, recommendation that this was out of order. I accept the, uh, uh, the advice of our parliamentarian, our General Counsel. And so, uh, I guess I'll turn it back to you, Trustee Harris. Uh, did, you want, uh, did you want to challenge my ruling? Uh, I, will then take it to, I will then take it to the board, or are you satisfied with the explanation provided by our General Counsel? Um, well, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but but suffice it to say that the uh, although I do understand that the St. Gabriel uh, situation was uh, we were we were closing a school with all with all uh, with all grades, 
that particular motion read the board of trustees approves the closure of saint gabriel school effective such and such uh, june 30th 1919 and that the k-6 to students from saint gabriel elementary be redesignated to saint brendan elementary junior high school for the opening of uh, september uh 20, 20 2019 2020 anyways um so so that's where i drew that from was uh, you know the structure uh, looking at at that structure that that was sort of consistent and it certainly was consistent with how we had approached this last time where we talked about the closure of St. Basil and then the relocation of this of the program. So hence, that's where that uh, that um, uh, structure of the amendment comes from. But if it is the will of the board uh, uh, or, or your your uh, will, Madam Chair, uh, to uh, Roll it out of order, then, uh, so with uh, on advice of general counsel, so be it. And so thank you very much for for accepting the um, um, my ruling. Uh, but that being said, if there are any trustees here who would like to uh, support Trustee Harris's, uh, please, I'm looking at the queue here. Please inform me now, and I will call a vote at this time. If I don't see anyone, then I'm assuming that to mean that the will of the board is to move back to the main motion, and we we continue from there. And I don't see anyone there. Trustee Harris, I hope that you're satisfied with the will of the board, the decision to move forward. Thank you very much for uh, bringing forward your um, uh, your concerns. And thank you to our general counsel for your legal advice as well. So that being said, I don't see anyone in queue. And I will now insert myself at this point and reference um, my own commentary. The preamble that I made earlier that the Polish community, parents, family, students and staff have been exemplary in their advocacy efforts and their passion is, as my colleagues have already mentioned, truly admirable. Chief Superintendent Martin, Superintendent Fiaco and staff, it's already been uh, um, it's already been referenced by the Board of Trustees. Thank you for your job of excellence. And so I, too, uh, Trustee Harris and fellow colleagues, am truly torn every time. But but that being said, we do need to follow our own rulings. We do need to follow our own motions and we do need to ensure that we adhere to proper governance. That being said, every time I hear someone from the community speak and express their sentiments and I hear their conviction and passion and how unique this program of choice is extremely valuable to the community, I'm conflicted just like all of you. And I guess I'm going to take it again from a different lens and I'm going to say if I had access and it was within my purview to recruit students, I would gladly do it. But I'm not Polish and I don't have the same access to the community as, as some of you do. And therefore, I am at a loss as to how to do this. That said, this, this enrollment issue that we're all talking about right now is not something new. It's not something that just came about last year or the year before. We've heard what our administration has had to share with us. The retention of these students in junior high as they transition into junior high is also not something new. And that's what I've been deliberating over. And so if I didn't have to justify my decision, as I said earlier, to Alberta Education and the other 96 schools and 43,200 plus students and staff, the decision would be easier, as there is nothing more than I want to see this program remain open. And why? I'm Italian, I get it. I mean, you close down a program such as this for the Italians, the same thing would happen, probably worse. So I do get it, I truly do. And I, too, looked for rationale and again asked myself why so many years later, the Polish community, inclusive of all the parents and families, are not choosing this program of choice. After all, it's not a new program. And while it's not my purview that this is a question that, 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 I, that I'm going to ask, I was asked by other stakeholders and one that I simply don't have an answer to myself. I'm not going to reiterate everything that has already been shared at the as the engagement process information is all easily accessible. But I will reference, however, that we have had a comprehensive report of why this recommendation is coming forward. The rationale for keeping it open because of emotional ties that the community has is admirable and commendable, but is it enough for us to move forward and defeat the motion? Maybe it is. 
And so, so through my own deliberations, I would like to say that I too, on the evening of February 12th in the gymnasium at St. Basil, there was a full house and it was noted that there were approximately 700 attendees and it was impressive. It truly was. It included the board of trustees. It included all members of our senior administration. And it was made very clear by the community at that time that there was no support from the community to move the program and the future of the program was dependent on maintaining the current location of the Polish program. Now, I know that one of my colleagues said, but they wanted it made central, but we didn't have anything central there. And so, you know, what we want and what we have are two different things. And so I believe, and it was referenced to again by several colleagues, that really the intention was to stay there at St. Basil. The intent of our administration and the board was not to close the program. We all know that. Had the intent been to close the program and not listen to the community, we would have done it then. Instead of relocating the, the program, this board of trustees gave direction to the senior administration on February 12th, which was announced in March of 2020, to look for ways to make the Polish bilingual program viable and sustainable at St. Basil School. And this information was shared with the community. That said, the same recommendation to relocate the program no longer came forward. We all know that. And so we're asking for something that we already have answers to. As clearly, this is not what we heard from the community at that time. They were adamantly opposed. At least that's what we understood. That's when we came together and spoke to administration and said, no, this is the way we're moving forward. And so despite the marketing strategy, the commitment to recruit more students did not occur. A concern that is not new. It has been, it has been decreasing for an extended period of time. But what is of even more concern is the retention rate of students in the program as they transition from kindergarten to grade nine. As we've all heard what the numbers are, the question that continues to arise is, there are many Polish students and families who have chosen other programs in Edmonton Catholic schools and maybe in other divisions, and they are fully aware of the program, and therefore it did, it was accessible to everyone. While it would have been ideal on the evening on February 12th, and that's what I would have wanted, that we had simply relocated the program then, we wouldn't be in this position today. While the Polish community may hold us accountable to keep the program going, there are other schools, parents, family, students, and staff who we've talked about the entire afternoon who are also holding us accountable. And we know that. They want us to justify to them how a program of choice that is not sustainable for years continues to be subsidized. I don't have the answers. I simply don't. So while we have wholeheartedly supported this program of choice for many years, as this Polish program we know is of value to the community and to Edmonton Catholic, the condition of offering such a program must have that long-term viability and sustainability that we talked about this afternoon, so that it doesn't negatively impact the resources available to all the other students in division. And even though the enrollment concern was not conducive to keeping a program of choice like St. Basil Open, in order to maintain enrollment numbers, we continued to offer bus service throughout the entire city as parents relied heavily on the service, and we did it gladly. But again, how do we justify to the rest of Edmonton Catholic and Alberta education who's waiting to see what we're going to do that for the utilization of nine routes required to transport and approximately, and I believe I heard 117 students throughout the city, We've created a situation where we are in a transportation deficit of approximately $417,000 for just this one school alone. And that based on the number of riders on each bus, and this blows me away, the average per pupil cost to transport St. Basil students is $3,560, which is 451% higher than the division average of other students a cost that further makes it difficult for this board. And so it is difficult. I believe Trustee Mutella referenced this, how some of us are going to justify to the rest of our stakeholders, some of which include the 43,000 plus students who may ask, why is my child not getting an additional $3,560 and using it in a different way? I don't need the transportation, but I do need this. 
And so we can argue this in many different ways and then different motions could potentially come forward. And so while for some, and while we agree, nobody wants to close a school or a program, especially one of choice that is greatly shared by so many, for many others, it becomes how come the division is not considering the needs of all students, of all schools and of all staff equitably, when year after year, the division continues to sustain a program of choice, which is not being supported by more Polish students and families. And so like in my previous deliberation, I was looking for anything, some kind of rationale, anything, justification, but based on the facts and the data and the projection, this program doesn't appear to be sustainable. I commend everyone who truly made a commitment to attend the school and applaud those families in junior high who stayed in your efforts to support the program. But this is not an issue that has just started. And I once again cannot, as I did back in February, justify the decision to the rest of the division. So while we understand the disappointment that some of our community and parents are experiencing, we're experiencing heartache too, because we're finding it difficult to move any other way. Please appreciate the position of this board who are being held accountable in justifying a decision of this magnitude and whose fiduciary responsibility is to ensure that instructional dollars are intended for all students in all 96 schools. And so at this at this time, um, I turn it back to Vice Chair Tuchansky to close your motion, uh, if you so choose. Uh, no, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And so at this time, I will call the vote and I will begin with you, Trustee Harris. Go ahead, please. I am not in favor, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Trustee Engel. I am in favor, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Mutala. Madam Chair, I am in favor. Thank you. Vice Chair Tuchansky. I'm in favor, Madam Chair. Thank you. Trustee Tiber. I am in favor, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I will also support the recommendation. For the record, please note this motion is also carried and we wish to once again express our sincere appreciation to everyone, to all of our stakeholders, our parents, guardians, staff, community members, and our remarkable students for your valuable input and feedback, particularly in a decision of this magnitude. And so that said, uh, we will now move on to 4.2 board chair report. So while the report is available for you to read on behalf of the board, we again, once again, applaud the efforts of our chief superintendent and, and administration and staff for their continued efforts to ensuring that the recent announcement of easing COVID-19 restrictions in our schools and for supporting um, student choice in wearing masks or not wearing masks, and for continuing to prioritize a healthy and positive learning and work in environment. Um, it's uh, attached as a summary of meetings, events, activities that were undertaken in my role as board chair since my last report. And this summary, of course, does not include those meetings that I attended as a trustee representing my ward. And as this is not a motion, I will read the recommendation for the record that the Board of Trustees acknowledges receipt of the board chair report on hashtag ECSD Faith Inspires January 21, 2022 to February 17, 2022. And this now takes us to 4.2, Chief Superintendent Report, and I will turn it over to you, Chief Superintendent Martin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to read the entire memo. I just wanted to highlight just a few things that uh, that have taken up our time over, over the month of January. And so uh, one of them was changes to COVID-19 tracking and reporting. I know it sounds like it's been uh, years of that, but in fact, it was only just a few weeks ago uh, where the there was an announcement of the distribution of PPE and rapid tests which required a lot of effort, logistical effort on behalf of our schools. And so uh, that, that was huge. And uh, just a, a huge thanks to all of our school staffs that had to count every mask and uh, count all the rapid testing kits and so on for the schools and for the kids. Uh, during the extension of the Christmas break for students, our staff were busy doing uh, professional development during that week, the week back uh, in the first week in January, because the kids did stay at home during that cold spell and uh, was a kind of a circuit breaker that the province had put in place. But our staff were working very, very hard during that time. Uh, again, uh, cancellation of January diploma exams occurred. I uh, wanted to make note of that. And um, 
The, our facility services team uh, began the work of installing MERV 13 filters in all of our HVAC systems. And it's my understanding they're almost complete with that. Uh, so that's, that's great news. And of course, our registrations have begun. And so uh, that, that, uh, that has uh, played a huge role. All of the, uh, the uh, open houses are virtual. And so our schools have been working very hard at doing all of that. Uh, and of course, our work on our new Lumen Christi Catholic Education Center is moving forward with the uh, move-in date to be uh, approximately July 1st. And so, uh, Madam Chair, uh, I wish uh, to uh, that the Board of Trustees acknowledges the receipt of the Chief Superintendent's report on hashtag ECSD Faith Inspires January. 2022 for information purposes. Uh, thank you, Chief Superintendent Martin. As always, we appreciate the outstanding work and dedication of you and your team. And while the report is succinctly expressed in two pages, the magnitude of this work is massive and we applaud the commitment. I am pleased to read the recommendation for the record that the Board of Trustees acknowledges receipt of the Chief Superintendent's report on hashtag ECSD Faith Inspires January 2022 for information purposes. And this takes us to 5.1 closing prayer and we will call on Trustee Ingle to lead us in prayer. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. As we're all aware, there's great trouble in the Ukraine. And tonight I would like to um, pray for peace. Uh, we acknowledge that many of our families in our ECSD community are affected by this, with friends and family of their own being affected in the Ukraine. And so I'm just going to, uh, I found a very nice, very nice prayer for peace. And it's adapted from Pope John Paul II's prayer for peace in 2001. God of infinite mercy and goodness, with grateful hearts, we pray to you today for peace. You offer us your peace continually, John 14, and constantly remind us that peacemakers are blessed, for they shall be called children of God, Matthew 5. May your voice resound in the hearts of all as you call us to follow the path of reconciliation and peace and to be merciful as you are merciful. We pray to you for the people of the Ukraine who are experiencing conflicts and deaths. Bless the leaders with wisdom, vision, and perseverance needed to build together a world of justice and solidarity to break down walls of hostility and division. To you we entrust all families and pray that they may never yield to discouragement and despair, but become heralds of new hope to one another in this challenging time. May you continue to inspire all of us to work all of us to oneness of heart and mind, to work generously for the common good, to respect the dignity of every person and the fundamental rights which have their origin in the image and likeness of God impressed upon every human being. Grant eternal rest to the dead and quick recovery to the wounded. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now ask our Mother Mary to intercede for the people of the Ukraine by praying together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of our death, Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Trustee Engel. Uh, that was extremely um, beautiful, and prayer is exactly what we needed this afternoon. It was a difficult afternoon indeed, and thinking about our Ukrainian um, uh, counterparts uh, back home, uh, our prayers are certainly with them. And I do see uh, Vice Chair Tuchansky in queue. Um, are you ready to make the motion to adjourn? Yes? Okay, thank you very much. Go ahead, uh, Trustee um, uh, Vice Chair Tuchansky. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to make the motion to adjourn the meeting today. Thank you so much. I will now uh, proceed to call the vote, beginning with Trustee Harris. Go ahead, please. I'm in favor, Madam Chair. Thank you, Trustee Harris. Trustee Ingle. In favor, Madam Chair. Thank you, Trustee Ingle. Trustee Mutala. I'm in favor, Madam Chair. 
Thank you, Trustee Mutella. Vice Chair Trachansky. I'm in favor, Madam Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair Trachansky. Trustee Tabear. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm in favor, too. Thank you, Trustee Tabear. And I also support the motion to adjourn. For the record, please note the motion is, uh, is carried. Thank you again. Wishing you all a wonderful evening and a blessed rest of your week. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.